Hey, hello, everybody. My name is Andrea Malchiodi, and I'm the current director of the, the Georgia Mathematical Research Center. Um, I would like to welcome you uh, to the meeting Combinatorial Direct Topology and Applications. And uh, I will just say uh, a few words and won't take uh, much of your time. Um, so um, I would like to say a few words about the center, the, the Georgia Center, which was founded about uh, 20 years ago, formally as a research laboratory of uh, Scuola Normale Superiore. So there are other laboratories. But uh, this has the purpose uh, of being uh, of creating opportunities for the community uh, of mathematicians in Pisa to gather. Uh, there are, of course, the people from uh, Scuola Normale, from the University of Pisa, so which are the two main, uh, uh, say, sources. Uh, and there is also a small community from uh, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, who is in, uh, which is in more applied uh, sciences. Um, so all these institutions uh, contribute uh, crucially to the uh, running uh, of the activities of the of the center, both uh, uh, say from the organizational point of view and also uh, financially. So the main activities of the center since uh, the foundation have been uh, workshops, uh, uh, intensive research periods, uh, schools, uh, and uh, we also have uh, uh, recently started a colloquium series named to to the Georgie. Uh, we have uh, visiting positions of uh, two types. Uh, there are uh, short-term visiting positions uh, to run research in uh, pairs or groups. Uh, and we also have uh, two years uh, uh, postdoctoral uh, positions uh, called uh, junior visiting positions. Uh, and there is, uh, they're actually open right now. And in general, we have uh, five positions uh, every year in different uh, subjects. That's all I wanted to say. And uh, okay, again, a welcome and uh, uh, have a good workshop. So I would like to thank uh, both the organizers uh, uh, for uh, bringing up this event uh, and also the staff of the center for their constant uh, and valuable support. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here with us today and tomorrow. It's gonna be um, a short workshop, but we hope that you're gonna enjoy it. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce you the first speaker of today, Jonathan Sprayer from the University of Sydney. He's going to talk about an algorithm to compute the cross cap number of a node. All right. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Um, um, thank you very much for organizing this and uh, for giving me um, an opportunity to talk here. Um, so what I will talk about today is something that's very much in the the theory side of the of the workshop, I think, but I hope I can sort of make a case why why this theory may also have some aspects that are important for applications. And um, in particular, there's this one theory I want to present to you today, which is called normal surface theory, which studies surfaces in three manifolds, but could be thought of a more general framework that can study co-dimension one manifolds in 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 um, in the, embedded in the manifold. Okay, so this is joint work with uh, Bas Jaco, Heim Rubinstein, and Stefan Tillmann. Um, um, this is sort of a group uh, I've been doing research with uh, for, for quite some time, and um, I might be able to mention some, some other related work at the end of the talk that's, that's also with these three people. Okay, all right, so Stefan Tillmann is with me in, in Sydney. Heim Rubinstein was formerly at the University of Melbourne, is maybe still affiliated there. And Buzz Jaco uh, spent a lot of time at Oklahoma State University among, well. All right, okay, so here's an outline of the talk. Maybe the first thing to say is um, the last bit we're probably skipping today. I just keep it there in case, <laughs> in case uh, um, I, I, I still have some minutes to, to talk about this. Um, I will quickly talk about motivation and then I will talk about sort of the uh, history of the problem um, or the, the set of problems that, that contains this uh, computing the genus of a knot or cross cap number of a knot. Then I will spend most of the time talking about this, um, this, this algorithmic uh, tool that's a normal surface theory that has the capacity to uh, turn um, theoretical questions in topology into a finite computation, although finite it kind of depends how finite it is, big numbers, but still you can do some computations. And in the end, I will um, um, explain how this all comes together to uh, to give an algorithm for the cross cap number of a knot 
this algorithm, um, although the running time could be, of course, more feasible, is still um, um, fast enough to do practical computations up to a certain scale. So you can still find new cross cap numbers with this this algorithm. So in fact, we did. Um, yeah. Okay. So why do we care? So first of all, I'm going to assume applied or theoretical that you are interested in manifolds, right? Um, so manifolds is a very, very uh, uh, um, standard or useful model to describe space. Um, so in particular, we will talk about three manifolds today. Um, we will talk about normal surface theory, which is a, well, co-dimension one surfaces. Um, but I would really uh, like to, to advertise that this is a tool to study co-dimension one submanifolds, although the theory is probably most complete when we talk about three manifolds. Um, so why would we study something like the cross cap number of knots? I think there's two answers to this. Well, first of all, we could be interested in knots, which I am, right? And which many people are, but also, um, if you're interested in surfaces and three manifolds, then then um, if you study knots or their complements, then, then many of the techniques you you figure out or you you develop um, can be uh, applied in a more general setting. Okay, so what can we do with surfaces and three manifolds? I mean, we can. This is sort of the main. I don't know the main main uh, character. Uh, in, in proofs about the complexity of three manifolds, answering questions such as what's the smallest number of tetrahedra we need to triangulate a certain manifold. Uh, it plays an important role in some uh, in quantum invariants uh, to distinguish between three manifolds. Um, so it turns out that some of these uh, called to Ravira invariants can be interpreted as a state sum over embedded surfaces. And you can use them to all do all kinds of other uh, obtain all kinds of other structural results. There's this framework of thin position, um, which is a tool to arrange a manifold decomposed into handles in a way that you can be sure to find these important surfaces, these incompressible surfaces, chopping this up into, into interesting blocks. Well, those are just three um, ways how um, studying surfaces gives you results about three manifolds. It's not very surprising that this is a powerful tool because, I mean, you if you look at a surface in a three manifold, there's only one dimension missing, right? So there's not much that can, uh, else that can go on. Okay, so um, more specifically, um, I, I mentioned that everything I present today works for arbitrary, well, not arbitrary, but, but more general classes of three manifolds with a torus boundary which is a more generalization of a not complement. Um, but because that's really difficult to picture if you compare it to an actual not complement, I will just talk about not complements today, right? So you can think of a more complicated manifold if you want to, um, but a not complement will, will do completely. Okay, so um, the setting for Janae is that we're looking at a not in the three sphere. And then if we take out the neighborhood of this not, then we get a manifold that's called the knot exterior. And um, what people have been thinking about studying knots, here's a knot, here's the neighborhood that we take out, is to think about surfaces that are in a complement, but not just any surface in a complement, a complement with a boundary that, that sort of spans the knot, which is, think of, um, the knot complement everything except for this this little solid torus, this knotted solid torus. And then um, we have a surface that kind of bounds the uh, this this boundary in this red curve, for example. So important thing is that it intersects the meridian disk here once, right? This is a spanning surface. We can think of this as bounding the knot. And uh, these spanning surfaces uh, are the surfaces we're talking about today. Okay, so natural questions, do spanning surfaces exist? I think this is a fairly um, simple um, exercise. If you have a diagram of a knot, you can fill this in in, in actually more than one way, but uh, this, this way, for example, the red bits here, you can think of this as a surface bounding the knot, right? We have like these twist regions here at the crossings. Um, what are the properties of these spanning surfaces? This is an interesting question, right? You can find this, this uh, um, the surface here. Um, the question is, of course, you can also find a surface with higher genus, right? You can just add like these handles. The question is, what is the smallest genus 
surface that bounds a knot. And then um, this leads to the genus of the knot. And then you can ask the same thing about non-orientable surfaces as well. What's the smallest non genus non-orientable spanner surface? Here we have to be a bit careful, right? The non-orientable genus and the orientable genus. It's easier to talk in terms of Euler characteristic. Two cross caps give us one handle <laughs> in the orientable setting. Um, so this this is e can easily be confused. But so so I will try to talk about the Euler characteristic of a surface bounding the knot. Um, and try to avoid genus and cross cap number uh, just because there's this factor of two that's that's kind of confusing a little bit. Okay, so here's a, um, an orientable surface. Well, this is a non-orientable surface, this red thing here, right? The Möbius band, three twists. Here's an orientable surface bounding the trefoil um, where you have like these two discs over each other and then you add these bands and that uh, works out well. Okay, so first, what's known about the genus? You could argue, well, pretty much everything we want to know. Um, there's an algorithm by Seifert that finds an orientable spanning surface, um, which is what I tried to do here as a cartoon. And, and I don't know if you ever took a, a knot theory course. I think this is one of the, I think one of the highlights, right? Um, so there's a, an algorithm by Crowell uh, that gives us a um, the genus of an alternating diagram, right? Knots for reduced alternating diagrams. And interestingly, only two years later, by Schubert, an algorithm that uses normal surface theory that, that gives us a um, algorithm for for computing the genus. So so you get a knot with a di given by a diagram, let's say, and it decides the Spitzhauser number, which is the genus of the um, of the ciphered surface. The, minimal genus uh, spanning surface. Okay, so um, you could say that the story sort of ends here. So in my like opinion, once you have an algorithm for a problem, maybe implemented, maybe running uh, in finite time, uh, maybe letting you compute interesting things, I think this is sort of like a, a natural um, 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 milestone in a problem that, that tells you that, that lots of the problem is known. Um, but of course, you can keep finding faster algorithms or do complexity analysis. And there's this very nice paper uh, I want you uh, to sort of tell about, which is the um, by Egel, Hass, and Thurston from 2005 that tells us that three manifold not genus is NP complete. So I'm saying this because this, I think, is one of the first complexity results in low dimensional topology. Um, so three manifold genus just means we look at a knot in an arbitrary manifold, not just necessarily the, the three sphere with some assumptions, right? And then you can show that this is an NP complete problem. Okay, so cross cap number, the the timeline, the order of the timeline is similar, but the dates are a bit different. So um, not theory, um, normal, well, typically, um, if you look about surfaces and not complements, a big focus has been for long like on orientable surfaces to the point that you're reading a paper and you're a bit confused <laughs> until you realize, well, people just talk about orientable surfaces, right? And, and non-orientable aren't even mentioned, right? Um, but um, so there's a formula that computes the cross cap number of a torus knot uh, by Terra Gaito uh, from 2004. There's, an in, there's a very related to what I'm telling you today. There's an, uh, a paper by Burton and Oslan uh, from 2012, um, where they determine an algorithm. Well, they give an algorithm that determines the cross cap number up to, well, almost, right? For many cases, they give a number, and that's the cross cap number. In some cases, and they tell you which cases, they give you one of two numbers, right? Um, so x is not the number, x is the number of numbers, right? So they give you between one and two numbers, and one of them is the cross cap number. So that's almost an algorithm. Um, there again, Adams and Kindred gave an algorithm for alternating knots. Again, that's the um, algorithm that has been um, around for a little longer. And then there's this bound, which I should mention, which is a very important bound, um, saying that the cross cap number, and here we get this factor of two, right, is less or equal two times the knot genus plus one. So what happens? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, maybe I should do that. <laughs> so 
yeah, here. So, so the cross cap number, maybe I should focus this more. It's the smallest genus non-orientable spanning surface. So um, you, and very good timing because now I can tell you, well, if you have a ciphered surface, a minimal genus spanning surface, what I can do is I can take a sort of a boundary color that's a Möbius band and just stick it on. <laughs> And then I have a non-orientable surface of one cross cap higher that bounds the knots. So the cross cap number is almost bounded above by two times the uh, genus of the cipher surface. That's just because of the discrepancy of, of cross caps and, and, and orientable genus plus one. And the fun fact is that sometimes this is actually, this bound is sharp for the right reasons, meaning that there is there are not complements um, where the non-orientable sanding surface of minimum genus is not boundary incompressible. So in, in some sense, it's it's wasteful, right? It's It it has like this extra boundary compression we can do, but then it's not non-orientable non anymore. So you can say that something of minimal genus realizing the cross cap number is not essential, an essential surface in the manifold. Okay, so I think this is like, when you first read this, this is really like... Uh, uh, was a little bit uh, surprising to me. Okay, so now, um, yes. So now, if you look at this algorithm for not genus, um, just like the algorithm to recognize the unknot, Harkins algorithm from uh, um, also the same same year more or less. Um, so this uses a tool called normal surface theory, which is a way of organizing all the embedded surfaces, throwing out the ones we're not interested in, keeping the ones we're interested in, and then kind of finding a way to find a finite enumerable basis of these and search in this basis and then have an uh, basically result saying, if this minimum genus surface exists, well, it always exists, like the minimum genus representative is one of these finitely many things. And what this is, uh, this is possible because uh, of this uh, tool that's called normal surface theory. And before I can sort of tell you what that is, I first have to set sort of the scene, what are the objects we're working with and, and how is a manifold presented to us. Okay, any questions up to now? Okay, so normal surface theory. So we're studying three manifolds and they have been represented in many, many different ways. I mean, you can give them as a Heger diagram, you can give them as handle decompositions and so on. Um, we normally work with triangulations just because that's easier to parse to a computer. It's easier to, to implement algorithms for this. So, but not any triangulation, the kind of triangulations we're looking at um, is you take a bunch of tetrahedra and just glue them along faces, right? And the only rule is uh, well, vertices have to go to vertices, and in the process, we cannot do anything stupid. So we cannot use an edge that's already the same edge and identify it with itself in reverse. Then we get like this singularity in the midpoint of the edge. And of course, in the end, if you take a neighborhood, a boundary of a neighborhood of, of a vertex, it must be a two-sphere. That's the manifold condition. Right? Okay, so... Um, so we have these n tetrahedra, we have these gluings phi, we factor them out in a very topological sense. And then we get a bunch of tetrahedra, normally given in terms of like a, a gluing table. And that has a natural sort of geometric carrier, an underlying set, and that needs to be homeomorphic to a manifold M. And then we say it triangulates a manifold M. Okay, so... Um, we may identify multiple triangles of pairs of tetrahedra together, which is forbidden in a simplicial complex. We may even identify two triangles of the same tetrahedra. We may even end up with a one vertex triangulation where all the vertices are one. So, so these edges are very bent and so on. If that worries you, it did worry me a long time ago when I went into normal service, uh, like, like low dimensional topology coming from combinatorial topology where you deal with simplicial complexes. You can always take the second derived subdivision of this complex and you get a simplicial complex back. So it's not too far, right? But it gives you some leverage for these exponential time algorithms to compute triangulations with very few uh, tetrahedra. And that's really necessary because otherwise you're dealing with too much uh, combinatorial access. 
Okay, so there might be unpaired triangles. That's the boundary of, of the manifold. And we will deal with that today because we have a torus boundary. Um, all right. Now, um, how do we describe properly embedded surfaces in a bounded manifold? Properly embedded meaning that the boundary of the surface uh, must be in the boundary of the manifold. Okay, so we start very easily. We just look at this on the level of a single tetrahedron. So if you look at the single tetrahedron level, you can find seven types, arguably two or seven, depending on whether you use symmetry, um, types of ways a surface can intersect a tetrahedron without any sort of funny things happening, right? Um, it could either chop off a vertex, right? This is like can done, be done at every of the four vertices, or it can separate opposite pairs of edges, right? So you either get a triangle or you get a quadrilateral. So we call these the normal disks of a tetrahedron. So what we don't want is like a disk that's embedded in a tetrahedron that has a um, kind of return arc. So, so with a boundary that starts and ends at the same edge that we don't want. And of course we don't want to have any connected summons inside a tetrahedron or, or like little circles and so on, right? So this is sort of a, a, a one way of uh, representing an embedded surface. And we say that a, norm, a surface in a triangulation, which associates to a manifold, right, is a normal surface if it's properly embedded and just made out of normal disks, right? Which means nothing else than if you intersect the surface S with some tetrahedron, it looks like this, for example, right? So you have you have any number of parallel pieces of any of the seven normal disks. Okay, so far so good. Why is this a good way to look at surfaces? Well, you can now just count the number of pieces. You have four variables, integer variables um, for the triangles. You have three for the quadrilaterals. This gives you seven for every tetrahedron. And well, in total, then seven n if you have n tetrahedra, right? So for example, here's an example. So this would be modulo permuting um, the, the labelings. This this bit here would be encoded by 0, 1, 2, 2, 0, 0, 3. So the three would be the three um, um, quadrilaterals. And then we have like the one here is the one, the zero is there's nothing here. And then the two twos is the two parallel copies of triangles, right? So far, if you just throw a bunch of these normal disks into a triangulation, it's a pretty pretty messy situation because of course they need to kind of glue up across triangles. They need to give a closed surface. But this is quite simple because if you look at this particular arc on a triangle, this can come from two things. It can come from this quadrilateral, it can come from this, from this uh, triangle and you can check that no other normal disk will give you this this normal arc and and in the neighboring tetrahedron is the same so if you want to ensure that your bunch of disks glue up to give a surface closed or with a boundary like properly embedded you get these kind of linear constraints right the number of of normal arcs coming from one normal arc is just a edge of, of a normal disk from one tetrahedron needs to glue up with the rest, right? So that's good. So now we have vectors in n to the 7n or r to the 7n, and you have these constraints that are linear. There's uh, three per triangle. There's two n triangles. This gives you six n of these. So this is good because we know these kind of spaces, right? We have like a Euclidean space. We factor out linear, uh, well, uh, hyperplanes basically. Um, through the origin and that, that we, we know what this is, right? Now, so this gives us something called the normal surface solution space. Well, not quite, but, but almost, right? So those are integer points in the polyhedral cone defined by the matching equations in R to the 7n. So now there's an issue with that, right? If you look at this tetrahedron, there's no space for another quadrilateral, right? There cannot be any other type of quadrilateral that's not parallel to the first one. So this brings us to what's called the quad constraints, quadrilateral constraints, 
that enforce that in every tetrahedron we have at most one quadrilateral type. And this kind of messes up our linear space a little bit. And this makes computations harder. So now we have these quad constraints. They take many forms. You can use them as a satisfiability clause, which some people told me they would prefer because that, that makes the whole problem uh, seem closer to, to these set problems. Um, you can also just take um, this quadratic equation uh, ensuring that um, that at most one of Q1, Q2, and Q3 is, uh, is non-zero. Okay, so this turns this cone that we're working with into a polyhedral fan, and the structure of this polyhedral fan is not at all clear. I mean, the, the, this is a bit more complicated, but you do get this, uh, this matrix of compatibility between normal surfaces. We will come to that maybe a li little later. That understand that that lets you understand the structure of the space but the issue is that computing this is costly yeah it costs a lot of computational resources so now this is the normal surface solution space this is an infinite space containing some surfaces that are embedded in the manifold so far that's not very useful right so here are a couple of extra um, definitions so there's something called the weight of a normal surface which is just defined as the um, number of times this normal surface intersects the edges, right? A normal surface is disjoint from the vertices of triangulation. It intersects the edges transversely, and you can take the weight of the surface as the sum of the intersection points with the, with the edges of the surrounding triangulation. Um, that will uh, play a role later on um, in the proof um, and then of, of, of the algorithm. And then there's something called the Haken sum which is a really important construction, which means, well, two surfaces are now just vectors and we can add vectors, right? And if the sum um, respects these quadrilateral constraints, meaning that the same quadrilateral coordinates in every tetrahedron are non-zero, um, then we can just take the sum um, of these two surfaces, S plus R, if the surfaces were S plus R, as an R, and this is then the Haken sum of um, of these two surfaces. Why is it good to have a sum? Well, we have an infinite number of things. Now we have the sum operation. Now there is a hope that we could maybe have a finite number of surfaces that are not sums of something, right? Right here is a picture of how a Haken sum looks like. We have these two uh, surfaces intersect one tetrahedron, and the sum is just adding disjoint union. Now the issue is uh, topologically this will resolve like uh, an intersection curve and it's not clear in which direction it will resolve this. This is a purely combinatorial thing. We have no control over um, in which direction this goes. Right? So this is a bit of a caveat. Without this caveat this algorithm for a cross cap number would have been immediate pretty much from the genus algorithm. Okay, so interesting properties. We have that the weight, of course, is additive under this Haken sum and also the Euler characteristic, which is important. Okay, so now a fundamental normal surface is a normal surface that is not a non-trivial Haken sum, right? This is like this, this basis. So now, luckily, we're talking about integer points in some linear space. <laughs> and now this fundamental normal surface just means um, that we're talking about the Hilbert basis of this of this cone, basically. And because of that, we can show that there's only finitely many of these fundamental normal surfaces. I say, they, they, okay, so I'm, I'm brushing some details under the rug here because I'm never talking about the quad constraints, but, but we have like a larger hill. Yeah, we, okay. You can show, <laughs> after taking the quad constraints in, into consideration, that there's finitely many fundamental normal surfaces, um, and they can be bounded by some function. This is uh, some constants to the n squared, where n is the number of tetrahedra. You can be more precise, but that this is basically what you get, more or less. This is a very, very crude bound. Uh, this is due to a very nice paper by Haas, Legarius, and Pippinger um, talking about the finiteness of normal surface theory. Not only can you bound uh, the number of fundamental solutions, you can also bound how many parallel disks they have in every tetrahedron. It's also very important. Now, you might think this is a very highly dimension high dimensional problem. 
uh, very big, large bound, is this even feasible for, for small examples? And it turns out if you fine tune your normal surface theory, if you throw out some extra things and so on, um, you can actually do these computations up to 30, I would even say like 35 tetrahedra sometimes. Okay, and now that sounds like a very small number, maybe for you, if you're talking about triangulation of three manifolds, depending if it's a simplicial complex, that's a very small number. But the good news is already with like 11 tetrahedra, there's a census of all triangulations, that, manifolds that you can triangulate and this 11,000 manifolds can be triangulated up to um, up to 11 tetrahedra. So, and that's where the enumeration stops. So, so you can, there's many, many spaces that have a triangulation that's, that's less than 30 tetrahedra. Okay, so now there's a teeny tiny problem, two of them that we have to overcome before this becomes useful, right? So now we have a whole bunch of surfaces and we know that whatever can be a normal surface is a sum, a Harkin sum of these surfaces. We can compute these this finite basis in well for not too large uh, triangulations, but we don't know what's in it, right? Could be a bunch of, of useless uh, surfaces that, that we know are in there anyway, right? So first problem is not every surface in T is a normal surface, right? Of course, you could think of a tetrahedron. You put in like a high genus orientable surface inside the tetrahedron. It doesn't touch the triangulation, right? We're not interested in the surface, but, but that's a surface that doesn't have a normal surface. And then, of course, not every normal surface is fundamental, right? And maybe the surfaces we're interested in are not in this finite basis. So how do we deal with this? First, there's not a universal solution, right? Whenever you use normal surface theory to solve some problem, you're always at the edge of sort of losing control. It's, it's always, you always have to kind of uh, uh, think hard to, to stay within um, the realm, realm of um, a finite computation, right? So the first problem is addressed by something called normalization, where you take a topologically embedded surface and in a triangulation, and then you start to turn it into a normal surface. And it turns out that normalization can be broken up into uh, uh, finitely many steps, and only some of them change the topology of the surface. Necessarily, some steps must change it. Otherwise, every surface would be a normal surface. To address that not every surface is fundamental, there's a framework called zero efficiency, which ensures that you get a triangulation that has no access to spheres or RP2s, yes? Um, I'll, I'll come to that in a second, but it's basically, for example, think of a torus embedded inside a tetra tetrahedron, it will just disappear. So that, in a sense, deletes a connected component, yeah. Okay, so zero efficiency, um, that's that's a framework where you change the triangulation such that it doesn't have positive Euler characteristic surfaces. And if you remember, the Haken sum is additive under um, under Euler characteristic additive under Haken sum, and uh, that at least gives you some leverage of saying, well, there's a bunch of tori and Klein bottles we cannot control, but the rest is finite, right? If you have a certain Euler characteristic negative two, we'd say that limits the number of, of negative Euler characteristic surfaces in, in, in any possible um, possible Haken sum. And then there's a special lemma we need for the special situation, unfortunately, due to Jaco and, and Cedric. Okay, so what happens during normalization? So this is the slide I think um, is most important of the talk. Um, so I just told you about this framework that lets us control a good portion or some portion of embedded surfaces in a three manifold. Um, and now this slide sort of is, is like a cartoon telling you what you lose on the way from an arbitrary embedded uh, um, surface. So first of all, that's, that's really harmless isotopies, right? So your surface might intersect the triangle in like these curvy lines, right? We just straighten them into, into arcs, that, that's fine. Could also happen that you have these return arcs, but you just push them over into straight lines. That that's totally fine. That doesn't change the topology, right? For all of these pictures, you have to 
I have to imagine there's a surface in three space and it intersects one triangle. Right? Now, this becomes a bit more worrisome, right? You may have a surface intersecting the interior of a triangle. So what this means is there's a compressing disk. So you find a disk in the three manifold that reduces the genus of the surface. So now you could argue, well, we, we are not interested in non-compressible uh, in incompressible uh, surfaces anyway, right? Which is not, not true, but um, this is where problems arise, right? So if you think about a Hegert surface, giving you a Hegert diagram, that bounds a handle body on either side. So there's plenty of compressing this. So this right away means, well, if we're dealing with Hegert surfaces, normal surface theory is maybe not the right tool, right? So in, in 3D, this, this looks like this, right? So, so you're simplifying the surface. There's the same thing at the boundary. This is maybe a bit harder to see. The gray thing is meant to be in the in the top, right? And and it got, we we're looking into the manifold. We have this this half tube that we can kind of cut and then retract, right? So this is called a boundary compression, which plays a big role in the cross cap number because remember I told you sometimes we can have these boundary compressions and we cannot get rid of them. Um, Right, so the, there's a little half disk sort of here, and you can sort of cut along it and, and push everything out. And finally, there's the deletion of components. But those are the only four things that can happen. Okay, so you start with a topologically embedded surface, and the normal surface will look like this. So now, obviously, those are also compressible, right? Those are also. So if you think about an incompressible surface, meaning a surface that doesn't have disks like this, those are interesting surfaces. Those tell us lots, a lot about the topology of the manifold, and this doesn't change them. This cannot happen. This cannot happen if your boundary incompressible, and this cannot happen. So if you start with an incompressible surface, it will show up as a normal surface. That's kind of the proof for this. So a corollary normal surface theory is great for finding incompressible and boundary incompressible surfaces. That's that's one class of surfaces, right? Non-examples, I told you before, Hegart surfaces, they don't fall in this category. There you have to actually extend normal surface theory to deal with them. Examples are unknot recognition. If you have a complicated diagram of the knot, you take the knot complement. If it's the unknot, you find this disk bounding the knot. If it's not the unknot, the disk is not there. So what you could do, you could enumerate normal surfaces, hope for the best that that sort of your, your disk shows up in the fundamental surfaces or prove a theorem that it does, as Haken did, and then just go through this list and look for a disk. If the disk is there, it's the unknot. If it's not, it's not. A bit more complicated, not genus basically does the same thing. Uh, you can also test if a manifold is Haken, right? You can take the fundamental surfaces, Again, there's some, some extra work to be done to show that the incompressible surface is actually one of the fundamental surfaces. And then you just check, is any of these surfaces incompressible? And if it is, it's a Haken manifold. If it's not, it's not. Now, what about non-orientable spanning surfaces, right? So I told you there's this boundary compression issue. And also there's the issue that Haken sum doesn't preserve orientability in any way. OK, so now this is how the zero efficiency and everything else uh, comes into play. So now I'm kind of talking a bit about the proof of the of the main result um, or the algorithm to to um, to uh, to recognize the unknot. Um, so this first slide is about how to make sure um, that we can identify a fundamental surface that's of interest to us. And then the final step of the algorithm, then, then, then there's some steps in between where you can sort of do some <laughs> Uh, um, can infer some things. And what I will skip over is the fact that where you then pin down the orientability. So that's that's a bit more like technical. I don't think there's like any any real uh, um, uh, merit of, of yeah, showing showing this in detail. Okay, so um, zero efficiency. Um, this is like a tailored definition that's yeah uh, to to our needs, but but it basically says what it is. A triangulation of a knot complement is called zero efficient if it does not contain a normal surface with positive Euler characteristic. So this interesting thing you can get a zero efficient triangulation algorithmically through a process that's called crushing, where you look at a two sphere 
and then you just crush it to a point and then you retriangulate. It's a very, very, very nice framework. Um, but in the end, you end up with a normal, with a, with a not complement. You don't have to worry about real projective planes because we're in S3, they don't exist. Right? <laughs> so um, you just have to get rid of your two spheres that are normal and that's it, right? In the end, you, you will always have a vertex link that's a normal surface, that's a sphere, but, but we, we ignore that. So that's basically um, taking care of that. Um, and now here's this um, very nice observation. So if you have a zero efficient triangulation of a knot complement, so yet now we need this, right? And you have two compatible incompressible normal surfaces with non-empty boundary, right? So you have this nice triangulation. You have a boundary that's a torus. It's typically a two triangle torus boundary. So it's just two triangles. Um, if you have two incompressible, Purposes that both bound this boundary in, a, in in an essential curve, then they must be parallel. The boundaries, they cannot intersect. This is a more or less it's it's quite um, quite um, elementary this observation because it basically follows follows um, intersection arcs inside the the surfaces, and you can show that that what you your assumptions are wrong basically. So now, how do we use this? Now let's start with everything we, we 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 just learned. So we have a zero efficient triangulation of a knot complement. We can get there algorithmically, and it's not 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 too bad. But I'm skipping this part. And we have a normal surface that's span a spanning surface, so a surface bounding the knot, right, running around the um, the the knot complement uh, intersecting the meridian these ones, of maximal Euler characteristic. Right? So we don't know anything about orientability, non-orientability. We know this normal surface uh, is a sum of fundamental normal surfaces. Right. So now, zero efficiency tells us all surfaces must be Euler characteristic non-positive. We know the Haken sum tells us that the Euler characteristic is additive. Right. So we immediately get this, this sum, and we know every sum is, is less or equal to zero. And now Jake and Cedric tell us only one of the fi can have non non empty boundary. Why? Because if you had two, they would intersect. Uh, no, they cannot intersect. So the Haken sum will be just two parallel copies. So now we have two boundary components, and that's not spanning a knot, right? So now we have our bounded surface f f zero, and then right away we know that this bounded surface is the only one that can have um, um, negative Euler characteristic, right? Or let's say at most this surface can have negative Euler characteristic and the other ones all have to have Euler characteristic zero. Why is that the case? Well, if there will be other negative Euler characteristic surfaces, you could just remove them from the, um, from, from the sum and you get a larger Euler characteristic um, bounded surface, which um, contradicts the maximality. Right, so you can just take one away, and then you have this larger bounding surface. Okay, so now we're almost done, right? So there's the surface S, and it's some bounded surface that's orientable or not, plus a number of tori. Yes? Uh, how do you ex exclude that, that? Oh, the number one, because that would be an RP2 a real projective plane, right? And we're talking about not complements here. So they cannot be a real projective space embedded in the three sphere. It's a non-orientable surface, closed, cannot be in the three sphere. So that's a lucky coincidence here. If you don't have a not complement, you have to work harder here, right? Sorry? Oh, disks. Well, if you find a disk, that's okay. Yes. We exclude, we say it's not the unknot. So, so we're not talking about the unknot. Um, the cross cap number of the unknot is zero. Um, if you have the unknot, you will also find out at some point because you will find this disk due to Harkin's unknot recognition algorithm. You will find this disk in the fundamental normal surfaces and then you know it's the unknot and you say, you spit out zero and you have the cross cap number. Okay, so yes, yes, yes. What I forgot to tell you <laughs> is that we're here looking at um, 
a non-trivial knot, yes. The trivial case is, is like a pre-processing step. Okay, all right. Now, yes, this should, um, we're almost done. Now, how do we leverage all this to get an algorithm for the cross cap number of a knot? So we have K not S3, we have M the knot complement, and we have a zero efficient triangulation of M. Now, there's one more technical thing I would like to sort of just, I need to tell you, but but this is really, um, um, you can do without, but then everything else becomes uh, more complicated. We need the zero efficient triangulation to have one boundary edge that's isotopic to the boundary of the meridian disk. Again, this is something we can just do, right? We can, we have a triangulation, we can just make this happen. This is only necessary uh, to, to, to restrict what can happen during normalization, okay? But we can also do without this. But this is the easier version. So what is, and the uh, point is this triangulation T can be obtained in reasonable time. There's algorithms for it and so on. So what is the cross cap number of, the, of K? So here's the, um, here's the main result. Um, the, the algorithm is uh, the, in a paper that, that's to appear in, in AGT. Um, it's also on the archive, of course. Um, I'll give you the identifier in the last slide. Okay, so here's, here's a statement that is trivial except for two little words. Let T be a zero efficient triangulation of the complement of a knot K with boundary of the meridian disk isotopic to the boundary edge. That's this extra condition, right? Then the cross cap number is the minimum of two numbers A and B, where A is one minus Euler characteristic of a non of a non-orientable spanning fundamental normal surface. And B is two minus the same thing with orientable, right? So all this is trivial unless you add this fundamental. It's basically just telling us we see what we see in the fundamental surfaces. Okay, so a little bit about how this, this works. Um, basically, we have this SN and SO are the non-orientable and orientable spanning surfaces of maximum Euler characteristics, so minimum genus. So we know right away, this is the trivial part, that the cross cap number is either one minus chi of Sn or two minus chi of SO. And this is like Clark's bound, right? Either we get our cross cap number realized by the ciphered surface with one extra Möbius band attached, or we get it by a non-orientable surface. So we have that Sn is incompressible, that, that's, that's easy. Um, uh, well, both Sn and So must be incompressible because otherwise we find a smaller, smaller genus surface. Um, we know that the orientable one is boundary incompressible. That's, that's the easy part because you can't do any boundary compressions uh, with this orientable surface. And we know that during normalization, this Sn cannot allow any uh, boundary compression because of this special edge. This is like a trick, right? So now it's easy cases if one of the other characteristics is larger than the other, then there's no ambiguity here. And we can just pick whatever it is, right? Um, now the issue is um, if they're the same. And again, I don't claim we have found these. I claim these exist, right? So the tricky case is this case X, and we can actually show that in this case, um, we can just take the Euler characteristic and take take um, <clears throat> um, so so here like just just to say this is where we find a fundamental surface, but we do not know if bounding the surface or the, if if the bounding surface is orientable or not, right? So we find these fundamental surfaces, non-orientable, orientable, and they have the same Euler characteristic, um, and now or the tricky case is we only find orientable surfaces of maximum Euler characteristic, but there could be a non-orientable surface with the same Euler characteristic that gives us a better cross cap number. So now we have to exclude the case that if there is a non-orientable bounding surface of the same Euler characteristic, that it doesn't show up as a fundamental surface. And that's now the sort of the, the meat of the proof where you have to say, well, if such a surface exists, it must show up as the, uh, as, as the non-orientable surface, right? So, and in this case, we can then say, well, if, if this is the case, we will find this one. 
as a fundamental surface, and then the cross cap number is is one minus this number, All right? Okay, so in this case, we can always find a non-orientable fundamental spanning surface of the same x. All right, this is all I wanted to tell you. Here are some pictures from the rest of the proof. <laughs> you have to think about how your surface lies and what the uh, you're kind of trying to find a contradiction to a torus intersecting an orientable surface, making this non-orientable surface, right? So here, this is um, some of the cross cap numbers we were able to compute of of um, of um, of knots where the cross cap number was unknown before. Um, I think we 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 uh, made this for all missing ten crossing knots and for some of the eleven and twelve crossing knots. In total, it was like two hundred and fifty we could handle. Hundred and I small triple digit number i should should look this up okay so that's all i think i skipped over this and here uh, those are this is the archive identifier i will end with a, a picture of the fairy tessellation which helped us prove all this and i sadly did not have time to talk about this but i made this picture so i wanted to show you this is basically um governing how um how so boundaries of um, um of, of surfaces uh, lie in a in a torus boundary anyway okay so that's all i wanted to say yeah i wanted to know um uh, how fast is this algorithm how so in in theory or in practice so in practice uh, <laughs> can i deal so with in... a 15 crossing not complex okay numbers? so so the issue here with the crossings right um with the crossings so we were able to find a small enough triangulation for for the 10 crossing knots the trickiest one was a couple of hours on on my laptop um the the problem with the other crossings is uh, with with the higher crossings the crossing number doesn't really tell you a lot about the size of the triangulation so some of them are very small but those are typically also the one where the crossing the cross cap number is known. Um, some of these 11 crossing knots, the smallest triangulation I found goes up to 40 or 42 or something like that. And that is then out of reach. But what you can do is um, 30 is fine, 31, 32 will take longer. I think the longest, uh, I let this run on, 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 on like a research server we have at the School um, of Mathematics in, in Sydney um, for, for like a couple of weeks <laughs> and then and then I stopped. Um so so that's um so in theory it could be a much smaller triangulation where this goes wrong just because you could have like many, many, many of these fundamental surfaces and the structure of the problem could be quite quite bad, but it's pretty reliable. I would say for a 30 tetrahedron triangulation, it would spit out an answer in a reasonable time. Yes. And second question, <laughs> is there an efficient way to uh, produce small triangulations or? Yes, okay, so so there's there's um, a couple of things you can do. So first of all, you, you take any, tr you take a diagram and then you immediately get a triangulation of the complement using at most four times the number of crossings, right? So that that's an upper bound, which is linear already. Then you can simplify it using these bistellar moves, like these these um, these local modifications, um, and then you have something that's often it's already zero efficient. If it's not, you can make a zero efficient triangulation um, that takes a bit of time, but well, not not as long as as the as, as the rest, but it again reduces the number of tetrahedra, and to obtain this extra edge condition, you sometimes have to add one or two tetrahedra to, to get the special edge, but you, typically it's already there. Yeah. Yes, but that's that's reasonably quick. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe this is just the uh, the numbers you've chosen, but for all of these, the, the cross cap number is always A. Is there, do you find that A happen more often than B or that yes, A was smaller? Yes. And, and um, 
or did B and, happen at all? And was B smaller? Fortunately, none of the things that we newly dis computed had the B. <laughs> I really tried this. But um, we know there's examples where B is the larger one. The, the smallest one has seven crossings, I think. So there's three examples, I think, where this happens. There's plenty of examples where it's equal. Um, but typically, there's a small non-orientable, no, small genus non-orientable surface. That that's the typical thing. The gap can be arbitrarily large. In uh, in torus knots, you can have an arbit arbitrarily large gap between the cross gap number and the genus. And and are those knots special in some way? Where uh, I I have tried to find any. Well, I haven't found any. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was I was looking at this. Um, yeah, so so there's I think there's a paper about the smallest one about the seven crossing, um, not but yeah, but yeah that that's about it. Yes, thanks. Okay, uh, the second speaker today is Paolo Salvatore from University of Tol Vergata, and he's going to talk to about a small combinatorial model for the homology spectral sequence for long knots. The board is yours. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be back in Pisa in uh, Centro de Georgia after a few years. I think uh, uh, Pisa is one of the, uh, the most appropriate places for <laughs> uh, to talk about uh, knots and low dimensional topologies. So I will follow the first speaker and talk again about knots, but from very different point of view. And uh, but also uh, um, from a combinatorial point of view, because uh, the conference is about combinatorial topology. So I, I would like to be able to do some uh, computations. So let first uh, let me first introduce um, <clears throat> a space I'm interested in, and uh, let me also say that this is joint work with uh, and, uh, Andrea Marino, who is uh, uh, is finishing his PhD. So Andrea Marino. Okay, so um, I'm interested in the, the space of long knots, uh, a space that uh, uh, I call the AMP D. So this is really the space of embeddings of the real line into the d-dimensional Euclidean space with compact support. What does it mean? So it means that outside a um, <clears throat> closed interval, it coincides with the standard embedding of, of, uh, of a fixed embedding of the real line. So a long knot uh, looks something like this. Okay, so at infin near infinity, it is a standard embedding of a real line. Um, so what can we say about the space of long knots? Uh, so space of long knots. in Rd. Of course, the classical and most in, in important case is d equal to 3. So d equal 3 is a classical case. But uh, of course, you can also consider a high, uh, higher case, higher dimensions. And uh, um, <clears throat> so there, uh, there is uh, an approach to, uh, to, to this space that uh, uh, comes from the so-called Goodwillie calculus. So um, approach via Goodwillie calculus. <clears throat> it it uh, basically what the Goodwillie calculus does for us, it constructs a tower and uh, the inverse limit of this tower will be our space or the homotopy inverse limit of this tower. Um, <clears throat> So what 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 does one do in practice is uh, um, to uh, the idea is uh, uh, to fix some points on the knot like uh, uh, t1, t2, etc., t k, and evaluate the um, the knot there and also its de derivative. But uh, for example, uh, for the moment, uh, let us uh, uh, forget the derivative. Ju if you just look at uh, uh, k distinct points on the knot, you get uh, uh, k distinct points uh, in, in Euclidean space. So this is, uh, lives in the configuration space. So um, if you basically have uh, some uh, knot here, f, 
then you have some uh, uh, let's say okay um, t1 tk ordered in r then f t1 through f tk belongs to the configuration space that I will indicate conf k of rd. Um, this is the, the space of k tuples of uh, points that are pairwise distinct. So conf k of rd is the space of k tuples of points in rd to the k, such that two points are different if their indices are different. Okay, so why uh, we are basically just uh, um, um, we are restricting our embedding to finite set, and now uh, <clears throat> the good thing about uh, uh, Goodwill calculus is that basically uh, if you put together all the configuration spaces and some maps between them, you can reconstruct the. Um, you can reconstruct the embedding space. At least this is true for the larger than three. So it's not always true, but uh, unfortunately not for t equal to three. But so what happens is that, uh, um, so um, there is an implementation of a good calculus due to the Sinha. So what, what he does, he, he constructs a, uh, some spaces that are almost equivalent to the configuration spaces but they are compact because configuration spaces are not compact typically when two points come together, for example, you can see it. Um, <clears throat> so we have natural direction maps that um, from the configuration spaces, conf k r d to the d minus one dimensional sphere um, to a certain power to the k choose two power what you do is basically for any pair of points, you can look at the direction from i point to j point. So if you have a, um, a k tuple of points here, you can send it to the direction. So xi minus xj divided by its norm. Okay, and uh, um, over all pairs, all, all, all ordered pairs of indices. So you get uh, uh, various direction. So let me call this map theta k. It turns out that if you take the uh, closure of this map, it is uh, almost equivalent to the configuration space. So um, the image of theta k closure um, has a name. Uh, so it's called uh, k dk. K means Konsevich. So Devsin had uh, called this space after Konsevich. Konsevich space. And uh, this space is homotopy equivalent to uh, configuration space. So this uh, um, is homotopy. So you can substitute up to homotopy the, uh, the configuration space by this compact space. Now, um, the advantage of using this, this model is that uh, uh, you can define some uh, combinatorial structure on the collection of these conceived spaces. So we fix the dimension and we let k vary. And it turns out that um, this family is uh, a co-simplicial space. So, um, what that Sina does is basically he defines, he shows that. The family k dk, where you uh, vary over k, is a co simplicial space. Okay, um, so co simplicial means just you have some uh, co faces and co degeneracies that are, so you have identities that are dual to the usual simplicial ones. Okay. Um, so this means uh, we have uh, some cofaces map, like di going from k d k to k d k plus one, and where the i varies between zero and 
k plus one. And we have, so these are cofaces, maps. And, oops. <laughs> and then we have uh, uh, codegeneracies. Um, SI that goes the other way. So from KD, K plus one to KDK. And uh, um, this goes uh, from, I goes from zero to K plus two to K, okay. Um, okay, let me give you an, a, an idea of what these maps are. So <clears throat> you can think of these maps are trying to double a point the height point in a fixed direction. So uh, intuitively what, what we are doing is maybe, maybe, okay, if I had configuration, so I have some element of, so I said that uh, the, the this space is homotopy equivalent to a configuration. So pretend for a moment that we are, looking, we are working with the configurations. So if I want to do a D2, say of this configuration, I want to double this point and, uh, but of course, if I repeat it, literally it's not a configuration anymore. So I have to, to move it a little bit and I decide to move it in the horizontal direction. So I decide to do this, one, two, then I, I just, uh, uh, I have to relabel. So I double this point in the horizontal direction. So in general, the idea is that DI uh, doubles a point at an infinitesimally close of course, infinitesimally close doesn't make sense. But uh, uh, in the limit, uh, if you project to this conservative space, it makes sense because all what you care is the directions. So the direction between points is all what you care. So if you double a point, you obtain basically the direction between one and two and one, three will be the same. Direction from four, four two, four, three will be the same, but direction between two and three will be horizontal direction. So all what I care is direction between points. So I hope that this is more or less clear. Um, so basically what DI does, this like doubles point. And okay. So um, except, okay, with an exception that are the extreme, so this is for i between zero, no, sorry, one and k, but uh, the extreme cofaces are given by adding a point at minus infinity or plus infinity. So let me just draw a picture as an example. So like if you have d0 of some configuration like this, it's just adding a point at minus infinity. So uh, you have I have something like configuration, like a point very far away, and these two guys here, and then I have to relabel one, two, three. Um, again, this does not make sense because I don't have minus infinity in configuration space. But if I just look at the direction, it makes sense because the direction between these two is the same. The direction between one and two is the horizontal. Between one and three is horizontal. So it makes sense. And uh, similarly, uh, if I want to add uh, D3 of this configuration, I just add the point at plus infinity. So I have something like one, two, and then very far away, three. Okay. Um, so basically, uh, the extreme, let's say that D0 and DK plus one add points at plus minus infinity. And so the cofaces have been de defined. Now the co-degeneracies, they just uh, forget points that easy. You just throw away one point. So as the co-degeneracy uh, co uh, forgets uh, the uh, I plus first point, okay? Okay, now um, this might look funny, but uh, somehow this is uh, what we need to define some uh, combinatorial uh, structure. 
I did something bad. <laughs> so, okay, let's resume. <laughs> um, okay, so we have this uh, uh, co-simplicial structure on the collection on the disconservage spaces. And, uh, um, okay, uh, you can also think that uh, if you if we have uh, a, a, a long knot from R to R D, um, suppose for a moment, uh, okay, you can identify the um, the open simplex to <coughs> the um, configuration space with of uh, the real line. So if you have some uh, embedding here. And uh, you have a, an element um, E1 to TK belonging to the open simplex. Then um, this is sent to an element in the configuration space. And then in turn, by applying theta um, to the conservative space, KDK. In fact, um, what you get if you if you check what happens is that uh, basically you can have a map from embeddings from the long knot space to the totalization of uh, this cosimplicial space. So let me tell you what the totalization is. Totalization, in general, of a cosimplicial space is a uh, um, is a dual notion of the realization of simplicial space. And uh, so <clears throat> there is, uh, um, in general, if you have a cosimplicial space, uh, K, okay, okay, um, say, okay, let's let's just look at our case. Okay, so KDK, um, a cosimplicial space. Now there is a natural cosimplicial space. Made of the all the topological synthesis, um, and uh, uh, basically, um, the simplicial spaces. So basically, you look at uh, just the space of cosimplicial maps from this. Uh, standard is called standard cosimplicial space to our cosimplicial space. So this this is just a, a subspace. Uh, it is I, right. Yes, you're right. Thank you. So it is subspace of the space, the product of space of maps. Uh, okay, from K simplex to K D K. Okay with a natural topology induced. So um, in fact, uh, uh, what happens, so Goodwill calculus tells us that uh, the homotopy totalization of this cosimplicial space is exactly homotopy equivalent to the embedding space. So this is the theorem by Goodwill and Sinha, basically, telling that uh, the homotopy totalization of uh, the KDs is somewhat equivalent to the long knot space and D. But this is true for D larger than three. Now, uh, so this is a kind of combinatorial thing that computes the homotopy type of the space of knots. But we, if we are just interested in the homology of the space of knots, then we can apply the standard machinery um, due to Bausfield that constructs spectral sequences for totalization of cosimplicial spaces. So this implies that there is a spectral sequence uh, by work of Bausfield. This, this uh, spectral sequence is also called the Sinha spectral sequence in this particular instance. So Sinha spectral sequence. And uh, uh, computing the homology of our embedding space, the long knot space. 
And uh, um, okay, uh, this this spectral sequence comes as usual, usually spectral sequence do from a double complex. So there is uh, coming from a certain double complex coming from our spaces. So maybe I tell you uh, what the initial term of the spectral sequence is first. Um, so co com double complex associated to our KDK, this simplicial space. Um, so the, the, the E1 term is easy, it's just the homology of the configuration spaces taken together. So E1 is just homology of K, D, K, and you take direct sum over all K. And uh, D, D1 is induced by the uh, disco phases maps. So D1 is just equal to alternated sign sum of the cofacing that induced some maps in homology. So it, it is the, uh, the, the sum with alternated signs, minus one to the i, of the um, cofacing maps. So maybe I, I use capital D for the spectral sequence differential. Uh, and these are the uh, topological cofacing, and they induced in homology some homomorphism. I take the sum, uh, sign sum of them, and this is D1. So this is very explicit. And in fact, it is very classical because this, this uh, homology is uh, very well known, has been computed by, uh, so this is classical, due to computation of uh, Arnold and Fred Cohen. Yes? Uh, it, actually, it, it doesn't change. I can choose any 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 direction, but I have to fix it. Okay, for for forever. So and but in homology, it induces the same map. Um. <clears throat> okay. So sorry, you were asking about the double complex or no? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes. So um. Yes, uh, um, well, yes, uh, I would say that uh, uh, one is D1 is horizontal and D0. Uh, so I have two, a, a bicomplex, a bicomplex. So, okay, let me write it explicitly because we, we need to know what it is. So, <clears throat> oh. so this comes from bicomplex. Uh, where you have the uh, singular chains applied to the spaces. So from bicomplex, uh, if I take singular chains of our space, spaces, K, D, K, where K varies. Um, so I have, uh, in fact, two differentials here because I have, uh, um, uh, so it's equipped with, uh, Two differentials that it is a uh, d zero and d one. So the total differential d zero plus d one, and d zero is just uh, uh, the just the differential in the singular uh, chain complex. So uh, differential in and d one is that one. So it's uh, alternated sum sum of d i stuff. So this is the bicomplex, complex and uh, um, they both square to zero and they commute. So um, this, I mean, it basically is the beginning of uh, setup of spectral sequence. And uh, <clears throat> moreover, if you care about uh, the final answer, uh, the homology dimension in the embedding space, 
you actually have to desuspend this by k. So if you desuspend this by k, then um, uh, the final answer will have the the right dimension in the in the in the bedding space. So what 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 can we say about this spectral sequence? Let me say some general results. So first of all, um, okay. So for results, okay. partial computations have been done by Turchin. So partial computation of E2, because it is very explicit. We know what E1 is, what is D1, so you can take the homology, just the homology. You need just a computer to do it. Um, OK, this is what Turchin did. And uh, uh, general abstract results, it is known what happens in characteristic 0. So let's work over a field. Um, so for d larger than or equal to three, uh, spectral sequence collapses at e two term. E two term in characteristic zero. There is a long story about this collapse because uh, uh, actually this is also related. So this Sina spectral sequence is very much related to the Vassilia spectral sequence. Conjecturally, they are the same. If you know Vassilia spectral sequence, uh, conjecturally, uh, Vassilia spectral sequence coincides with the Sinha. <laughs> but Vassilia spectral sequence comes from singularity theory from singular, uh, and Sinha spectral sequence instead from embedding calculus. So it's hardly, it's very non trivial to compare them. <clears throat> But uh, uh, for Fasilia spectral sequence, for example, there, there was argument by Konsevich in the 90s. And then uh, uh, again, uh, for the Sina spectral sequence, there are many authors that worked it out, uh, uh, work out this collapse, again, using ideas of Konsevich and much more work, of course. But uh, uh, this is settled at least for D larger than or equal to three. Um, but nobody knows anything in positive characteristic. So uh, nobody has done any computations. So in uh, in characteristic P, what happens? Nobody knows. And uh, in fact, I think that Vasilia conjecture that uh, it, uh, there are no higher differentials. So Vasilia conjectured conjecture collapse over all coefficients, conjecture, collapse. Uh, and maybe he computed some low differential. Notice that this is, uh, uh, we are talking about this case, because for d equal to, it's a pathological case, if you like, but where there are a lot of differentials, so strange, d equal to would be about two-dimensional, I mean, not in, in, in R2 <laughs> that are not very interesting. Um, but uh, so M2 is contractible, but uh, uh, the spectral sequence can, starts with a very big uh, E1 term, E2 term, but then it, one expect that it converts to zero. But this is true only in characteristic P. So it's a strange things happen. So like uh, in uh, in characteristic uh, uh, zero, there are uh, differentials, but uh, uh, okay, some differentials. But uh, it does not uh, converge to zero. But of course, we are outside all the convergence bound here. So, uh, but uh, uh, infinity is not is not zero. In uh, characteristic P, 
instead it uh, uh, converges to zero. So all the thing, all the elements disappear along the spectral sequence page. So this is kind of spe very special case, the, the two-dimensional case. <clears throat> so what we did was, well, let's try to find a, a, a way to compute these differentials to in a character positive characteristic, and let's start to do it uh, for p equal to two. That is easier uh, for computational uh, uh, <clears throat> implementation. Um, let me say also, okay, there are also some results by uh, Boavida and Orel. They have uh, uh, trivial differentials in a range. Okay, so um, trivial differentials in a range up to uh, dimension uh, something like uh, uh, p minus two, <laughs> maybe in the or n, sorry, sorry, d times p minus two. But anyway, in the for three dimensional knot, this, there is no bound because. <laughs> Two minus two is zero. Uh, okay, so this the, the most interesting case is for us is p equal two and try to understand d equal three. Although the Sveta sequence does not converge to knots, it still gives you some invariance of knots. So it, we are we are interested in uh, in this computation. Um, okay, so let's do it. And uh, if we want to understand the uh, a combinatorial model of configuration spaces. There are various models. So combinatorial models of configuration spaces, what are they? Combinatorial models of configuration spaces. Um, so there, there are uh, simplicial models It's uh, the so-called uh, Smith filtration of the Barateclas, uh, Operad, Smith, uh, and Barateclas. That are very big. So in principle, you can write uh, an algorithm that computes these differentials, but in practice, it's useless. Then, uh, slightly better, it's a multi-simplicial model uh, by McClure-Smith. Like Clure and Smith. And uh, the good thing about these models is they are uh, co simplicial. So you can literally run on a computer uh, an algorithm that computes the spectral sequence for you. So I tried to do this maybe many years ago, but so this is impossible. This I tried many years ago, but it doesn't work because it's still too big. So <laughs> I couldn't compute anything. And uh, now uh, the next uh, uh, smaller model is, uh, uh, in fact, what I call the Fox Neuwirth. Uh, Poset. And this is a, a combinatorial model for, uh, for the, uh, the configuration space. So, <clears throat> Let me tell you what it is. So it is a, a poset that uh, uh, has a nerve. Um, the realization of the nerve is the equivalent to the configuration space. So Fox, uh, uh, Fox Neuwirth in dimension D of K points uh, consists basically Okay, of uh, uh, trees on K leaves with um, D levels. So these are rooted trees. So let me give you an example rather than uh, uh, writing the formal definition. So the example is, uh, for, let's take d equal to two and uh, k equal to three, I'll uh, write down 
some uh, uh, examples. So for example, we have one, three, two. <clears throat> so there is a, a, a tree like this that corresponds to a cell in the configuration space. So um, if I have three points, I can suppose that the first two lie on a vertical line and the second is to the right. So this means that the first two points share one coordinate and uh, uh, these two points, the second has larger second coordinate than this one. And this point has larger first coordinate than these two. And this is encoded by this uh, tree where I can have up to two levels, basically one and two. And uh, so you can guess that uh, each of these trees will be associated to a cell in the configuration space, okay? So this is a, a, a tree in the poset f and tk. And this is a sigma t is a cell in the configuration space, conf k of r t. Well, precisely, this is open cell. It's not CDA, it's a compact cell. So um, if you take all together these uh, cells, they form a uh, cell with the composition of the one point compatification of configuration space. So we have a <coughs> decomposition of, uh, um, okay, uh, CW decomposition of the configuration space conf k r d plus one point modification with cells uh, that are infinity and then sigma t where t is one of these trees with levels okay t tree with level and uh, uh, the co-dimension so let's look at the co-dimension of these cells, the dimension is equal to the equation that you have to put between the, their coordinates. So <clears throat> uh, the codimension of a cell will be uh, the sum over all the vertices of the tree of their distances, their distance from the root. Okay, so it's the sum of the distance between the minimal distance between a vertex and the root where you vary the vertex. For example, in this case, the codimension is just one because we have just one vertex at height one at, and uh, uh, we are just imposed one equation. But you can have more, more complicated things. And uh, uh, so this was for d equal two, but uh, you can for d equal three, you can have more complicated things, like maybe you have uh, <clears throat> some uh, planes, and then you have two points sharing two coordinates here, and one another one sharing just one coordinate, etc. Then one and three here. So this is another one, two, three. Uh, I, they don't have to be ordered, of course. <laughs> so, uh, so I can put whatever order I want. So I can put three, one, four, two, uh, five, se uh, seven, six, for example. Uh, the, the, okay, points that in configuration lie on this on this uh, thing, they will co correspond to a certain tree that you, you can figure out. Uh, okay, so the nice thing is that uh, uh, um, this set is, uh, is a poset. Why? Because these cells, they are ordered, so you can declare that uh, T is less than or equal to uh, s if the cells uh, the cell sigma t is contained in the closure of sigma s. So there is a, a natural uh, poset structure on these cells, and uh, in fact, I said that this is a poset. And it turns out that if you uh, realize this poset, if you take the nerve, then uh, you get a simplicial complex. And uh, its uh, uh, realization is somewhat equivalent to the configuration space. So you take the nerve of this poset, F and D, K. Then you take realization, 
this is somatopic equivalent to the configuration space. So this is a good combinatorial model. Uh, okay. But uh, it's still too big <laughs> because a cell, a simplex is a ascending chain of cells. So there is a much smaller model that in, in fact is the Salvetti complex in this special case. So there is a, a if you reverse the order, so um, okay, actually the, the theorem, let's say by Salvetti, but it's a special case. Salvetti and De Concini, let's say. Generalization is that uh, uh, this is a CW complex. This realization, a CW complex that is regular um, with a cell for each three. And uh, uh, this is much less because one cell for each tree, not for each ascending chain of trees. Uh, for each tree, um, and uh, has dimension. So let, let me give you a name to this uh, cell. So this was sigma uh, t. This will be a uh, tau t for each tree and has dimension equal to the co-dimension of the dual cell. So it has dimension, dimension of uh, tau t is equal to the co-dimension of sigma t. So it gets reversed, the, the inclusion of the cells gets reversed. And uh, uh, now this will be uh, a, a, a cell of decomposition of a space, this somehow becoming into configuration space. This is somehow a, a, an instance of Poincare duality because you have, uh, of, if you like, left shed duality because you have homology of the one component quantification is dual. Uh, uh, to the to the homology of the configuration space, and uh, you swap co-dimension and dimension. Uh, so okay, so th th this is nice thing because we have uh, uh, a very small CW complex that is uh, uh, equivalent to the configuration space. this way so for example this cell has just dimension one the dual cell has dimension one it was the co-dimension of this cell and uh, just to give you a, an example if you look at configuration of two points configuration of two points in rd uh, it is known that this uh, Space is almost equivalent to the sphere, dimension d minus one. And uh, uh, this uh, complex, in fact, is the sphere with uh, the cell decomposition with two cells in each dimension, like the between zero and d minus one. This is exactly the Salvetti complex with uh, 2D cells. <clears throat> okay, so this is a nice and small model. And uh, now I, uh, but I, I, I want to apply the cosimplicial machinery. So can I apply the cosimplicial machinery? So how about cosimplicial structure? This is beginning of what is new here. Uh, so uh, first of all, we observe that, uh, in fact, it is true that F n dk uh, is a poset in, the, in, in a cosimplicial object. So it is a cosimplicial poset. Uh, poset. And I want to tell you what the 
cofaces co and cotegenesis are. Let's see what they are. So the uh, it's similar, it's inspired by what we did for configuration. We were just uh, doubling the point in a certain direction. So basically, uh, we have that the I doubles points, uh, so to say, in a vertical direction, the last coordinate. The last coordinate, and here it is important because here the poset are really given by uh, a choice of ordering of the coordinates. So in the last direction. So just to give you an, an idea, an example, if I want to, uh, again, I start from this thing here, one, three, two. I want to double the third point. I do this. I just transform the point three into a, a, a pair of point three and four. So I just double in the vertical direction, except uh, if I have to add uh, D zero, I add uh, a point below the first one. And uh, if I want to do D K plus one, I add the last point above the last one on the right. So something, uh, let me just write uh, D zero or maybe uh, D4, uh, yes, D4. D4 of 1, 3, 2 is equal to 1, 3, 2, 4. So I just add the last point above the, la the last one on the right. And uh, the code generalists just forget points. So again, so SI, um, I'll give you an example again. So S1 of one, three, two is just, I forget, uh, okay, let's do this zero. So I forget one and I just get this three and two. So it is clear combinatorial structure and in fact, it's co-simplicial, you can check. So it's co-simplicial and then uh, uh, if you apply the nerve, then you get uh, again a co-simplicial uh, uh, simplicial set and you can apply Again, uh, chain, co chains, sorry, chains, and you get uh, a, a bicomplex. So, again, spectral sequence. So, you, you can again, the nerve of FNDK is a co simplicial, simplicial set. Then, if you take the uh, simplicial chains of this, this is a bicomplex. So this certainly might be smaller than the than the previous attempts, but this is still too big. Yeah. For computation, it's impossible because this nerve has a lot of of uh, simplices, as I said. But uh, how about why don't we use the Salvetti complex? It is much smaller, so maybe it works. But uh, unfortunately. Uh, <clears throat> It turns out that uh, our uh, cosimplicial structure maps are not cellular. So they don't work. Uh, yes. So D2 is, uh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a mistake. Uh, I, I, Okay, I should have, uh, I, I throw again, yes, sorry. I throw away point one, so I'm left with two and three, but I have to relabel from one to two. So just this relabel. Yes. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, let's see. So um, you can see this, uh, uh, so unfortunately, so let's say that, uh, um, okay. So you just take, I'm working with coefficient in Z2, Z2. So I said that uh, the trees, they form a certain chain complex. The um, 
well, the, the cellular chains. So these are the cellular chains. This is really the vector space generated by the trees. This is the cellular chains of the Salvetti complex, okay? So unfortunately, this is not a cosimplicial object. So this is a, has a certain differential that I call D0. The differential is just uh, um, of a cell. This is the usual differential because it is a... a sorry. Um, okay. See. Yes. Okay, if it's degenerated by the tree, um, the differential is just the, the sum. And here I don't have sign because I'm working over F2, is the sum of the uh, the cells T prime such that uh, tau of T prime is inside the closure of tau T or, and has co-dimension co one, of course. So, of course, the boundary of a cell is the sum of the cells in the boundary that have co-dimension one. This is the... Say CW, this is a CW complex, so this is the usual differential. Unfortunately, there is no uh, natural uh, cosimplicial structure here. And uh, um, so we don't have a bicomplex on these objects. But the hope is that if you deform a bicomplex, you get a so called multi complex. So the hope is you have a multi complex. structure on them. So what is a, a multi-complex is a, a family of differential, numberable family of differential, satisfying a certain uh, uh, identity. So we have uh, here, OK, I have to say what, what uh, convention I use. Um, let's see. So OK. So a multi-complex, um, so typically I have a bigrading and uh, uh, I have some uh, maps, the, uh, let's say, the R going from C S T to C S plus R comma T plus R minus one. So it is uh, similar to what happens in a spectral sequence, the same by grading you expect in a spectral sequence. And uh, this differential have the property that uh, um, this equation holds. So if you do um, the sum of all possible compositions, then uh, where you fix R plus R, L is fixed, you get zero. So you say it's a generalization of bicomplex. But by complex, you have two differentials and uh, that commute. Here, uh, so you just stop here at, uh, you have just D0 and D1, and you have no higher. But here you have a whole, whole higher DR, DR where R can be any positive number, a natural number. So uh, I claim that there is such, such structure on our uh, chain complex is there. So, claim at least for d equal to, let's start for d equal to, there is explicit um, uh, multi-complex structure on the vector space generated by the trees. And um, let me tell you uh, the beginning. So D1. D1 basically uh, doubles in the horizontal direction. So, so it is doubles in horizontal direction. And uh, uh, then shuffles the other. OK, let's say, let's see what, what, happen, what, what happens. So, Sorry, so I have to be more precise. So this is the sum of D1i, where 
<coughs> d1i doubles in horizontal direction the point i. So what does it mean? For example, if I want to, um, again, take d1 of this guy, um, OK, d1 of, of this guy, what I have to do is I have to double point 0.1 in the horizontal direction. So I do something like this. I double 1 into 1 prime and 1 double prime. And uh, But now 3 is here, but 2 could be here or could be here. So I have to take the, the sum of two contribution. So I, I will have something like uh, this uh, contribution plus the other contribution. That is 1 prime is here. 1, 2 prime is here, and 2 is here, and 3 is here. So you have to distribute all the, all the other points in all possible ways. And uh, of course, 1 prime, 1, and then I have to relabel, so uh, following the order. So this becomes 1, 2, this becomes 3, and this becomes 4, and here the same. But it's, uh, yes, we have to relabel here. OK, um, it is the idea. And then this 0 will point, uh, there is really a contribution that puts a point at minus infinity uh, on the left horizontally. And the last will put uh, a point on the right. And so it turns out that this is the, is the right d1. And uh, as I promised, uh, it turns out that this is not co-simplicial anymore. So. Uh, if you try to do d1 twice, it is not zero. So unfortunately, d1 square is not zero in general, because there is a correction term. So there is a correction term. Um, in fact, you get that uh, uh, d1 square plus d2 d0 plus d0 d2 is equal to zero. And what is d2? So what d2 will be the sum of d2, 1j, over all pair of indices, where uh, d2, 1j, uh, doubles two points this time in horizontal direction, uh, if, they are, if they lie on a vertical line. If they lie, they lie. So let me give you the example. D2 of this uh, pair of points doubles at the same time the two points. So you get one prime, one double prime, two prime, and two double prime. So you go from two points to four points. Um, yes, because the, if you remember, D1 adds one point. D2 adds two point, etc., And then I have to relabel here, of course. So it becomes one, uh, three, two, and four. OK. And similarly, dk uh, will uh, uh, double simultaneously k points, dk, that uh, line on a vertical line, and, and then distribute the other points. So there is a very explicit formula. It works. And uh, this uh, allows us to compute some differentials of course, we are still in D2 equal to 2. That's not so important. But uh, still, we can reproduce some computations that were, due, that were done recently by Moria using the Vasilias Petr sequence. And we can reproduce them using this machinery in the Sinhas Petr sequence. Uh, OK, now let's pass through. Uh, how, how long do we have? Five. OK. <laughs> this is a more interesting case, of course. It's a classical case, not in dimension 3. So how about uh, uh, co-simplicial structure here of the Salvetti chain complexes? So um, for, OK, D0 is as before, just some of the subcells of the dimension 1. And D1 is similar. Uh, again, you have to 
repeat a point in the horizontal di direction and then distribute the others, but the others might be, might line on a common line or a common plane. So yeah, there is some combinatorics here. Uh, then there is D2 that uh, again is, uh, uh, okay, D2 is, is a little bit new, a little bit, for example, if I have uh, uh, D2 of uh, two points in R3 sharing two coordinates, so the line line, then this will be um, something like, uh, so this is a cell of dimension two because they share two coordinates. Uh, has to go to, a, a, let's see, see what happens. We get something like this, one prime, two prime, then, um, okay. One double prime, two double prime, plus, uh, this is the cell of dimension one, two, three, three conditions. And uh, plus, uh, uh, see there is some inversion. So there is two prime, one prime, and then one double prime, two double prime. So the sum of two cells of, of dimension three. And D2 is uh, then derived from this, and then there is D3 that uh, where we stopped because it's already quite complicated. So we could guess what the formula is for D3. The most interesting part is when you have three points sharing two coordinates. So there are various terms, and then there are some terms quite interesting that are these ones, like the, the six, uh, you get six points here, you have to get three, six points, and uh, they are uh, in three couples. So in three couples where you put, uh, let's see, okay, one. So you have to double each of them somehow, two prime, three prime, three double prime, then uh, one, uh, one prime, one double prime two double prime, and then there is another term that is similar. So this is the most interesting part. One, because when you run uh, the separate sequence, okay, three double prime. So this is some new phenomenon that we didn't see in uh, dimension two, like uh, six points, you, you double three, uh, three points, you get six points, you organize them in three lines. And uh, uh, there is a contribution to the spectral sequence. If you're, uh, now we can write the spectral sequence of a multi-complex. Uh, it is a kind of standard and can be done. Uh, on a, can be implemented on a computer. That is what we did. And uh, so let's have a look at the uh, Vasilia spectral sequence. So very very briefly, what happens is that, okay, uh, let's see. So we have something like this. So this is uh, the number of points. Okay, this is the dimension, uh, the homological dimension of the classes in the configuration space, two, four, six, eight. Now we have, okay, number of points, uh, uh, one, two, three, four, etc. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now uh, there is a line that corresponds to zero-dimensional classes. This is not invariance. Uh, this line is has okay. Uh, one element here. Then we have four and four. So uh, two-dimensional here. Then we have six and six is uh, uh, six dimensional and 10, um, sorry, sorry, eight and eight. And then 10 and 10, you have 10 dimensional, whatever. So th this is the, the dimension zero invariance, but there is little hope that we can find a differential that hits this line because the uh, facility invariance, you know, like uh, there's, there's been a lot of computation. So it's, it's very, but uh, how about if you look at positive dimension? Maybe you can find something interesting. So a positive dimension, uh, so there is some one dimensional thing here, then, uh, okay, forget to, sorry, to, to put something between here, sorry about it. Yes, yes, so sorry, I messed up. <sighs> okay, so this is two, one, then six, we have zero to three. 
Then for eight, we have one, two, six, six. So this number seems small, but if you look at the complex, <laughs> you find that like there are millions of generators here. So it's really difficult to go beyond these points is impossible, basically. And so here we have something like zero, two, four, 11, 10. Okay. So the first point where you might hope to find a non-trivial differential is from dimension two to dimension one, namely from here to here. This is the first, first possible point where you can have a non-trivial differential for some, for some reason. And so we uh, basically implemented uh, computation using this machinery. And it turns out that this differential is non-zero. So it is the first known computation of a non-trivial differential in positive character, first non-trivial differential complete in dimension three because it rationally collapses. In positive characteristics, conjecture to uh, collapse. But this is uh, uh, takes few hours to compute this, and uh, is is uh, is non-zero. So it is. Uh, uh, but if you like, it's a con uh, countersable to conjecture Vasilio, except that Vasilio, we don't know the Vasilio spin sin has spectral sequence is the same. But if it is the same, then it's a counter example. And anyway, it's the first computation of uh, non-trivial differential. So, thank you. Uh, okay, in characteristic, we, we as opposed to rational or well, the fact is that rationally we have the formality uh, theorem by Konsevich, like the configuration spaces are formal and opera is formal, so somehow. It's a general nonsense that tells you that uh, the sex sequence collapses in two term. So we don't have to care about higher differentials. Somehow we can just compute D1 and that's it. But in positive characteristics, it, is not, it was not known whether it would collapse or not. So you have to really to do the computation uh, on the chain complex and the chain model explicitly to check if it is true or not. So this is what we did. Um, uh, okay, in dimension above three, uh, there is there is a whole uh, many things. Of course, it's connected. So you know, any any two knots are isopotic, but topology is non-trivial. So there is a lot of uh, work of literature on these spaces. I can hear. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, it's a, I'm, I'm sorry to ask this, like a technical question, probably, but like when you're looking at this uh, simplicial space and you're trying to compute the homology of totalization, it's somehow dealing with homologies of uh, inverse limits and fiber sequences, like. I'm a bit worried about convergence. Is this something like in this case just works out or is it something general that uh, this? Uh, I, I, so it converges for D, again, for D larger than three. So for D larger than three converge. For D equal three, everything goes wrong. Some... So it's some kind of connectivity arguments that allow you to. Uh... So we, we have the set of six, but it's, it is not known whether it converges. It is not known what it converges to. So somehow it, but it still gives you some not invariance. So oh, I see, I see. So the so that it always converges to homology of the embedding space that is only when these uh, yes. bigger than three, and that is uh, like a non-trivial argument. It's not some yes. general nonsense about. Yes. Yeah. It's a specific connectivity. Uh, I, see, I see. I see. I see. Story. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. For okay. Three, everything goes wrong, but still gives interesting information. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Is there any connection between the Fox-Noiret 
model and the other two models, the multi simple show and the simple show one? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. So it's uh, probably different, but uh, it's, uh, it's smaller as less structure. It's a typical thing. You have a smaller thing, you lose a structure. But uh, the last speaker of this morning is Jason Smith from Nottingham Trent University. Great pleasure to have you here. He's going to talk about brain structure functions and rel reliability explored using combinatorial algebraic topology. What is yours? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go more in towards the applications side of the title of the workshop. Um, we're going to use kind of combinatorics and topology to explore brains. Um, and there's not going to be any heavy theory. There's definitely no proofs. Um, but there's some interesting theoretical questions that crop up out of this, and I'll point these out. And there's also a fair amount of kind of nice theory going on in the background here um, that we'll allude to, if not fully explore. Um, uh, but a lot of it is more actually about the applications of this stuff to some some real data. Um, so I've split this into three. So they've got the structure, function, and reliability. We'll only briefly talk about reliability, time allowing. We'll mainly focus on the structure and the function. Um, the background to this and a bit of context is that um, in neuroscience, a lot of the kind of understanding of the structure of the brain so far has been done at a macro scale. And by macro scale, I mean kind of region to region within the brain. And this is largely down to limitations of the data, right? You can get region to region data because you can use fMRIs, which are great machines for looking at the brain, but they only give you kind of tell you that this part of the brain here is active versus this part here. Um, but what we're really interested in is neuron to neuron scale data. So proper down to the micro scale, these neurons connect to these neurons. But trying to get that data is difficult because basically you have to cut up the brain and that severely limits how much you can understand function because once it's cut up, you don't get so much function out of it. Um, but it also limits how much you can actually do because the human brain has about 90 billion neurons in it. Um, and in order to map neuron to neuron, you have to look at each individual neuron and say, look, then follow the axons and the dendrites and see where they connect to all the other neurons. And trying to do this for 90 billion things when they're very small is very difficult. Um, the first connector that we had was C. elegans, uh, which was back in the 70s. And they did this this way. They, they cut, up, cut it up, they looked at all the neurons and they mapped where all of them went and they cut all the whole data of how these neurons connect together. But it only has 300 neurons. So that makes it much easier. Um, but in recent years, this this has come a long way. And so there's more and more data coming out about how these brains are built. Um, so you have things like Drosophila, which is the fruit fly. We have full connectomes for that. Um, the regions of the brain are coming out. We have C. elegans through different stages, uh, zebrafish, bumblebees. There's loads of stuff going on. And all this data is coming up. And it's only happened in the last few years. So the question in kind of connectomics uh, in brain networks has gone from how can we get the data to what do we do now that we have the data? So this is what I want to focus on. How can we use tools that we everyone here kind of likes, all this theoretical, nice combinatorics, nice topology? How can we use this to study this plethora of data that's suddenly available in the last few years? So um, we're going to focus on structure first. And the data that I'm going to use to demonstrate these techniques comes from the blue brain. Um, so this is an initiative in Switzerland where they're trying to basically build an artificial brain. So this is a model. This is an actual data from a rat, but it's a model of a rat's brain. And they use the real data that's coming from all the labs to then build, basically grow a brain that they have at a neuron to neuron level. Um, so it's part of the smartest sensory cortex of a rat. It has around 4 million neurons in it. Um, it's split into two types of synapses. We have the local synapses and the long range synapses. So the local synapses are ones that connect together the neurons that are spatially close. And the long range ones are ones that kind of go across this region. So they kind of, you can see here that the green ones, these are the local ones. And then you have long red ones, which connect kind of from somewhere over here to somewhere over here. Um, importantly, this is functional. So you can input stimulus into this thing. The neurons will fire and these signals will propagate through the system in a similar way to how the brain works. Um, and we have different morphological types, so these neurons are different. And that's what these colors are here. These are different layers within the brain. So the layer six down here is these green ones, and layer one is the white ones. And it's kind of 
the green is kind of deeper into the brain and the, the yellow here is kind of the top surface level. And these behave differently and this will be important with some of the stuff that we see in a minute. And now this is a model. There are many, there are numerous discussions among neuroscientists about how accurate this model is and the advantages and disadvantages of using this and whether it's worth doing at all and this kind of thing. And I don't want to get into that details because that can, it's a rabbit hole that you don't want to go down. Um, but the point of using this is to dis develop the tools so that once, as this data is coming more and more available, once we have a full neuron to neural connectome of what my brain looks like inside, by that point, we'll already have developed these tools so we can actually analyze that data. Because the data is coming out at the minute, but the tools aren't there. So we're using this data to develop tools, but I don't want to go into the limitations of the data itself. Okay, So this is the model we have. Um, and the first thing we do okay, um, is how can we use combinatorics and topology here? And well, this is made up of a collection of neurons that are connected to other neurons by synapses. So let's treat it as a graph. Okay, Every neuron is a vertex. And if there's a connection between the neurons, we put an edge between those vertices. And in particular, it's a directed graph because synapses are directed. They send signal from one neuron to another. Okay, When a neuron fires, it sends voltage across the synaptic connections to the other neuron. So there's a direction. To this. So we have a directed graph. And in fact, we have two directed graphs here. So I'm going to treat, oh, we have three directed graphs here. Um, three directed graphs. All three of them have 4 million neurons, but I'm going to treat these synapses differently. So I'm going to say we have a local graph, which has uh, nine, 9 billion edges, roughly. Uh, we have a mid-range graph, which has 4 billion. And then we have the combined thing where we take both, all of these edges, and that has around 13, mil 13 billion edges. Okay? So we've got 4 million vertices and 13 billion edges. Because what I really like to do is play with impossibly large data sets that's really difficult to compute anything on, because that's where the fun is. Um, so the first thing we do is look at degrees. Okay, start simple. We have a graph. What do the degree distributions look like? Okay, so here's just straight combinatorics, no topology or anything. Um, so the green stuff here is the local circuit. The orange stuff is the long range circuit. And if you look at the degree distributions here of the local circuit, you can see that there's nothing particularly um, jump out um, that jumps out of us here. Okay, the in degree is roughly the same as the out degree. Total degree is roughly double it. I mean, this goes to 3,000, this goes to just under 3,000. Uh, but the distributions look pretty similar. Um, and we've got some control models here. So we ran Erdos Reni, stochastic block model, configuration model, and distance block model. Um, I don't want to go too much detail of what those are, uh, but you can see that the degrees there, they are drastically different. The degrees drop quite a lot, right? They don't go as high and they look quite different distributions. So the, the brain that we have is not just a random graph. Okay, the degree distributions already tell us that it's different than random. Okay, but how different from random is it is one thing we're gonna look at and how different does it change between these circuits and also other data sets that we have. Um, you'll notice that the configuration model, you can't really see it very well, but that's this kind of dotted line that runs along the edge here. That has exactly the same degree sequence because the configuration model is designed to have exactly the same degree sequence. Okay, It's essentially where you take your graph, you cut all the edges, and you reconnect them all. Um, so the degree sequences are exactly the same. Um, so the local one, okay, it's different than the random model, but that's not a surprise. Uh, the long range one, you'll note here, if you look at the x-axis between the in degree and the out degree, it's vastly different. Okay, So the in degree goes up to 6,000, and the out degree goes up to 130,000 or something. Okay. So we can already see with the degree sequence that this long range circuit is quite different than the the, the local one. So what it is, is it's, you've got a few kind of what we call hub neurons or monster neurons, as we started to call them, uh, which are kind of neurons that have very high out degree and they send stuff out. And this makes sense biologically because what these uh, long range circuit is kind of doing is it's sending information a long distance. So there's a few specialized neurons here that are designed to do this. Uh, you kind of um, you can think of it as kind of local activity happens somewhere. Um, so go back. Okay, so you've got some local activity happening here, say, and then that will connect to one of these long range ones, which then sends that signal over here to another long range one. Then that communicates with the local here. Okay, a good analogy is airports, right? You have local infrastructure. You take your train to the local airport. You then fly a long distance to another airport, and then you take the local transportation there. Okay. The brain is doing something similar here. You can think of this long range as kind of these long intercontinental plane um, connections or something like this. If you look at this one here, you, this, these are the uh, different neuron types. So the X and the Y axis here are different neuron types. And this is then the likelihood of those neuron types connecting to each other. So if you look at the local one, you can see that the neuron types, they all connect roughly the same. There's, there's various variation here, but there's nothing obvious standout like there is here. 
where if you look at this one, it's just one single line. And this is the out degree, the rows. So we can see that there are two types of neurons that are acting as these hub neurons that are connecting a long distance. And these are layer five, that's the L5 here. So that was the uh, the blue layer here, layer five, this one here. Um, and they are pyramidal cells, tufted pyramidal cells and untufted pyramidal cells, which are just certain types of neurons. Um, so these neurons are ones that are connecting long distance. And again, you look down here, you can see that we have sources and sinks and isolated vertices. So a source is a neuro, a vertex that only has outgoing edges. A sink is one that only has incoming edges. Isolated vertex is one that's not connected to anything. Um, and we can see the difference between the layers here. So the gray here is the difference in kind of neuron numbers. So layer six is much bigger than the other layers, as you kind of saw in that picture. And layer one is much smaller. Um, and here we can see the difference of isolated versus sinks and sources. So you can see that in layer six, there's loads of isolated vertices. So actually this long range circuit doesn't connect to the layer six very well. It's using layer five to send this information in the, the higher layers. And then the local computations are kind of being done in layer six. Um, and you also see that you've got lots more sources happening in these lower layers than you would expect just by the number, but also a reasonable number of sinks in these low layers as well. Uh, layer five actually has a rather uniform distribution of what you would expect. Um, and that's because layer five, they're not really sources or sinks, they're both receiving, yes. Um, no, we didn't do preferential attachment. Um, the reason for this was um, mainly because the distance is a better model of what we wanted to do. Um, the the distance, the, the way that it's grown, like neurons are more likely to attach to each other based upon their distance. Um, a preferential attachment would make sense, and we, maybe we should look at that. But the, we were trying to look at what the, the early 20s, like the standard, right? You just do that. Configuration model, we were worried about degrees and how that changed. And then the closest model we could think of was distance, because the neurons really do depend upon the distance. So this is what it looks like. Um, OK, so this tells us about degrees. Uh, the next thing we looked at was uh, cliques, or we call them simplices here. And this is because we were looking at the directed flag complex. Okay, So if you take your graph, um, you look for the cliques within the graph. And here we're talking about directed cliques. So it's a graph clique where every all the vertices are kind of uh, ordered in some way, so that the edges go from the smaller vertices to the bigger. So it has a source, it has a sink, and all the edges kind of go orientated in this way. Okay, so then we take the directed flag complex. So this is the simplicial complex whose faces are these cliques within the graph. And we tried to count the number of uh, simplices in this thing. This is exactly the same as counting the number of cliques in the graph. Really. So you can think this is counting cliques or counting the simplices of the flag complex, wherever you prefer your combinatorics or your topology or somewhere between. Um, and we can see here that if we do this, the number of uh, simplices is still much bigger than any of these controls that we did. And here you can see the configuration model now drops down to here. So before the configuration model in the degrees, we saw it's exactly the same, but the configuration model is still nothing like this actual graph that we have, because there's way fewer simplices, way fewer cliques than we would expect. And actually it only goes up to dimension three here. So you're only getting um, four cliques, three simplices. Uh, whereas in the actual graph, it goes up to dimension seven. But you can see the the distance block model. This is the closest one. So distance block model is like distance model, but um, we change the probability of the connection between certain types of neurons. So you have both the distance between the neurons and the types of neurons that are counted for. But even that still doesn't get to the actual model. So basically all I'm saying here is that a circuit is not random. There's more structure here than just randomness. So can we kind of extract what this is? And on the right here is the long range circuit. And you can see here, uh, the gray here is the combined circuit. So the orange here is the long range, the gray is the combined, and the blue is the sum of the combined and the orange. So the blue here is if you add this orange line to this green line here. And you can see the, the uh, orange is if you take the union of the two graphs and you can compute it, um, compute the simplices. And you can see that the gray here is much bigger than the blue. And in fact, the blue is not that much bigger than the orange. And this makes sense. Above dimension seven, there's nothing over here. So it's going to be exactly it, but bigger than dimension seven. And then you get a bit of a bump over here. Um, but what this is telling us is that the, the long range and the local are interacting with each other quite substantially. Putting these two things together gives us loads more simplices than just taking them individually and adding them together. Okay, There's loads of interaction happening between these two circuits that we get. So simplicities tells us a little bit more than degrees, um, but it also tells us something very important, which is that computing this stuff is a pain in the ass. 
All right, these orange, these are uh, this gray one here that took me three months to compute running it on 40 cores on a hyper on a cluster. Okay, so three months just to count the number of sympathies. And as many of you are aware, doing kind of topological computations is difficult, let alone just counting sympathies. So we're limited in what we can computationally do on these large circuits. So what we try and do instead is extract some key subparts of the circuit that we think represent the whole circuit that we can then use to study and do that. Or not necessarily represent the whole circuit, but at least represent interesting parts of the circuit. Um, oh, before we go on to that, let me just talk about comparing this to other complex, other ones. So I talked about these other data sets. We have connectomes, right? We have C. elegans, uh, which is a little worm, looks like this. We have Drosophila larva. So this is a baby Drosophila, baby fruit fly. And we have the actual one I just showed you here. And you can see that in all of these as well, we get the same kind of pattern. So again, it goes up to roughly seven or eight dimensions. Um, the configuration model drops down much lower than this. So uh, I find it quite interesting that we actually get the same dimensional cliques here between these circuits. Uh, so this is something that seems to be consistent between species. And it also helps verify that our model here is actually adhering to biological things that we would expect. And the reason this adheres to the local one is because these things are quite small, so they don't really have long range circuits. So we can't compare this to the long range, only to the local. Um, but it seems that these simplex counts do kind of uh, seem to be fairly consistent between species and they go up to dimension seven. Obviously the counts here are very different. This thing has 300 neurons. This one has 3000, this one has 4 million. All right, there's very different numbers of very different sizes of circuits, but the pattern seems to be consistent. Okay. So back to what I said before, we want to extract some key elements of the circuit, which we can use to then kind of understand the circuit without having to consider this whole monstrous 4 million thing and uh, 13 billion edges that it has. Okay, um, so we use the idea of a core for this. So this is an idea in graph theory that is well established. This is kind of a K core in a graph, uh, but we're going to introduce some kind of topological variation of this. And we call this the simplicial core. Okay, so the N simplicial core of a graph is just where you take all of the, the subgraph induced by all of the vertices that are contained in a K simplex or greater, but actually it doesn't matter if it's greater. Okay, so take, for example, uh, suppose K is seven. So I take my graph. I take all of the vertices that appear in a seven simplex, which is an eight clique. Um, so all the vertices that appear in a seven simplex, and then I take the graph induced by those vertices. And this will give me a subgraph of what I had originally. Okay, and the idea being that these vertices that are in the cliques, these are key to the central core of the functioning of the circuit. Okay. So we did this, and we looked at what these vertices look like. Um, we get a similar distribution in terms of layers here. So in the again, green here is local, orange is uh, long range. Um, so the green one here, you can see that they're kind of consistent through layers. You get a few more in layer six, but um, but also in the sink, there's a few more. So there's some variation here, but it's consistent between layers. Um, whereas in here, you get a lot more in layer five, but um, in, in layer five has a lot more sinks in here. Um, but also layer four has more sources, which is quite interesting, which is something that we didn't see in just looking at degrees. Um, we can look at where these vertices are in these simplices. So the simplices are directed simplices. So they have a source, they have a sink, and they have a position between this. Um, and we can see that this is the number of neurons that are within this core and where they occur within these simplices. So the green one here is fairly consistent between position, right? There's roughly the same number of neurons that appear as a source as there are as a pair as a sink. Whereas the orange one here seems to go up. So you have a lot more neurons that are appearing as sinks versus appearing as sources. And again, this makes sense from what we saw by looking at the degrees. We saw that there were kind of some neurons that were sending out to loads. There were some of these centralized neurons with high degree that were sending out to lots of neurons that are around the edges. So there are loads more neurons that are sinks. So we have a lot more neurons that are occurring as sinks than we do as sources. Uh, then we looked at the location. So the spatial location of these neurons, these ones, these neurons that are in the core, so where these cleats are. And as you can see, they're kind of spread out around the circuit. So the, the dark color here is the, the location of these core neurons, and the dark color here is the location of them in the long range. And they're kind of spread out. In both of them, they're spread out. We've got swatches where they, where they occur. And over here, we then look at the connectivity between these core neurons. So this is just um, the a dot if those vertices are connected, if those neurons are connected. So in the local, you can see that you've got kind of clusters of things that are connected to each other, but not necessarily connected between. And this makes sense. If you look at this picture, right, 
connections in the circuit only occur if they're spatially located. So you wouldn't expect connections between this dot and this dot because they're spatially distant from each other. Um, so you're going to have connections within these dots, but not massively connections between them. Whereas if we look at the orange one, we can see that actually there's lots of connections occurring between these long range neurons. Uh, so actually all of these dots are highly connected to each other still. Um, the next thing we looked at is the path between these neurons, okay? So how long does it take me to get from a neuron over here to a neuron over here between these core neurons? Are they really highly connected to each other by these paths or not so much? And how is this affected by adding in the long range connections? So this is the path distance between the seven core vertices. So this is the in the local circuit. So this is the seven core. So this is all the vertices that occur in a seven simplex in the local circuit, where seven simplex is the top dimension. So essentially, it's all the vertices that occur in a top dimensional simplex. And then we look at the distance between them. We look at the distance between them only in the local circuit, and then the distance between them if we add in the long range connections. So the max distance between them is seven. And here, the x-axis is Euclidean distance, y-axis is path distance. So the max distance between these local core things is only 7. So actually, the diameter of this graph is still quite small. It's got 4 million neurons in it and uh, was it 9 billion edges. But the diameter here is only 7 between these core. And actually, even if you take the whole graph, the diameter is not that much bigger than that. You can get from most neurons to most others in a fairly short connection, even, even by only taking these local steps. But if we add in these long range ones, it brings this down. So the max distance then drops to five. So there's only gray things in the five, all the gray ones appear disappeared. So the max distance, if you include the long range, drops the distance down to five, and it also loses out this kind of correlation. So the green here you can see is highly correlated to the Euclidean distance. But once we add in the gray, this disappears. And this is what you'd expect, right? If you start adding in these long range connections, then the Euclidean distance is less relevant to the path distance. And then we looked at kind of the makeup of these paths. So how does it work? So the idea was, what I said before, like there's lots of these neurons in layer five, which are connecting to other things in layer five and then sending locally. So if we look at this makeup, so we take a vertex here from the core and the local core and see how do we get to another one in the core over here. And we just look at three paths. So paths with three edges. Um, where does it go? How does it get from here to here? And it turns out that a lot of the time it goes through layer five, which is again, what we'd expect. All right, so here, the distribution here, the gray is just the distribution of neurons, so how many we would expect. And then the red stuff here is how many appear in the second position, and the blue is how many appear in the third position. And don't worry about the cross-hatching and stuff. I, I want to ignore that. Um, so you can see layer five occurs massively more in these paths than one would expect for given the number of neurons in layer five. So adding in these long-range things is really demonstrates what's happening is that we are doing this local activity, often in layer six, this local activity tends to happen, communicates with someone in layer five, sends it long distance to somewhere else, and then sends that information. Um, next, I want to talk about Rich Club. So the Rich Club is, again, an established metric in graph theory of this idea that high degree vertices are more likely to connect to each other. Okay. And this comes from economics data. That's why it's called rich, right? Uh, rich people are more likely to be friends with rich people. Um, wealthy countries are more likely to trade with wealthy countries. Okay. Um, and it's defined in the following way. You take all of the vertices of a certain degree. So let's say degree five, any vertex that has degree five or greater. And then you take the graph induced by those, okay, which is this. And then you take the density of that graph. And that's exactly what this formula is saying down here. It's the number of edges in this graph divided by the number of vertices, n minus one, exactly density. Uh, so in this case, right, you have um, six edges, four times three vertices, you end up with one. Okay, Because this is a complete graph, it has density one. Uh, and here I'm doing this for undirected graphs, but it applies exactly the same for directed. You just kind of drop the two, essentially. Uh, but I just keep it undirected now for the simplest. Okay. Um, so the idea of this is how uh, how likely are high degree things to connect to other high degree things. So we ran this on the graph. Does the do these graphs have a rich club? Um, and so the rich club here is this left thing here. We computed it, and it gives you a value somewhere between zero and one, right? Some density. Um, but there's a problem with the rich club in that it is known that the bigger your graph, the higher the rich club will naturally be. So we have to normalize it. So we normalize it by taking our graph computing a configuration model, computing the rich club on the configuration model, and then dividing the, the rich club of the original thing by that. 
Okay. And then that essentially says, does this heading have a more of a rich club than one would expect in a random control? And if you have a value bigger than one for that, you say it has a rich club. If the value is less than one, you say it doesn't. So if we look over here, we can see for the local, all of these things are bigger than one. So we say that the local thing has very much a rich club. The high degree things in the local are more likely to connect to each other. Whereas in the long range, it's consistently below one. So we claim that the long range does not have a rich club. However, this kind of disagrees with this plot that we saw before. All right, we saw in this plot that if we take the core vertices in the long range, they're highly likely to connect to each other. Um, but our rich club information here is telling us that actually across the whole circuit, this is not the case. And the difference here is this is taking things of high degree, and this is taking things that belong to the simplices. So there's a difference here between these two. Um, but in the local one, when we look at this, actually, I'd say this doesn't have a rich club. These things are very disconnected. But the data here is telling us the opposite. Okay. So how can we account for this? So instead of taking the vertices of high degree, let's take the vertices that belong to simplices. And we define this as the simplicial rich club. So here on the left is from that graph I saw a second ago, if I take all the vertices of degree at least three. Okay. So the traditional rich club approach. I would then take the density of this graph, and that gives me the rich club. But on the right here, instead of taking things of degree three, I take things that belong to three cliques. Okay? And that gives me this graph. And you can see that this then extracts this kind of central structure from my original graph. Right? If I looked at this graph and I'd say, okay, is there some kind of central core to this thing? I'd say, okay, this thing's kind of a core. This kind of thing needs to be connecting everything else to each other. Um, and But if I just take degree, I don't extract that. But if I take cliques, then I do. And then I can define some special rich club in the same way. I just take the density of this graph. Okay, so this is the number of vertices uh, that belong to a D clique divided by the number of edges. And I have two parameters here. I have a D and a K. So the D here is the dimension. So I say this is belongs to a three clique, but I could say how many three cliques it belongs to as well. In the same way of saying the degree has degree five, take bigger than degree five, I could say, okay, well, all things that belong to at least five three cliques. In this case, I just said belong to one. If it belongs to one three click, I take it. But the reason this links to the topology is right, these three cliques are simplices of my flag complex. So it's also saying how many simplices these vertices belong to in the flag complex. Um, and if we run the simplicial rich club on the data that we had, then we get these plots here. And you can see for the local one, there's not as much happening here, right? In the top dimension here, so seven is the top dimension for this thing. Um, there seems to be something happening, but it's still um, kind of skewed over here and, and not much. Compared to the long range, you can see everything seems to be consistently going up, which to me indicates that there is some kind of simplicial rich club going on here. However, there is a problem. This one is normalized, right? And this allows me to easily say, give you exact parameters that say, if it's greater than the one, it's a rich club. If it's below one, it's not. I can't do this here because I can't normalize this. Okay, so Here I normalize it using the configuration model. And I take the configuration model and I divide the value that I get for that. And that tells me if it's more than I would expect for a random. Or if you've dabbled with some special complexes, you might know that random special complexes are a pain in the ass. Um, there are some nice models for random special complexes, but there are none that do what we need. And what we need is we want a random special complexes that fixes the number of times a vertex appears in uh, syntheses, in particular dimension syntheses. Because right, that's what's happening here. This is our metric. Our metric is the number of time a vertex appears in a K clique, which is the number of times it appears in a simplex in the simplicial complex. So we want a random control model where we can fix this metric of how many times the vertices appears in here. Um, and this leads me to this question. How can we normalize the simplicial rich group? Um, and this is a really nice actual theoretical question from um, combinatorial topology of can we make a random special complex model that fixes this parameter? And the answer is, as of yet, no. We've played around with this quite a lot, and we have some models, and we're still working on this. And we'd really like to be able to do this, because I think in order to properly use this as a metric for extracting this information, we need this random control model. But this is where the uh, thing falls down. And I'll talk about this again later on. Uh, but a lot of the, th the problems I find in doing applications of combinatorial topology come down to control models. Because there are some really nice control models for graphs, which allow us to compare this to random controls and, and verify that this is more than we would expect. But the same just doesn't seem to be there for simplicial complexes. Um, and mostly when I'm doing uh, topological analysis, this kind of stuff, it's always in simplicial complexes. So 
I think one of the big holes in the terms of applying some of the theory we have, it really is control models. We need better control models of some special complex. All right, that's the structure. So um, my point of this was to try and demonstrate that we can do, there's some really nice combinatorics we can do on this structure and that gives us some information. But once we bring in the topology as well, we seem to get more. Okay, the topology tells us something that the normal combinatorics is not. So there really is some benefit to doing this topology. But uh, there's two big problems. The big problem, one is computational issues. Uh, doing any kind of topology, there's always computational issues. When you throw it onto a 4 million vertex graph, it gets worse. Um, and the second is control models. We need better control models to verify the information that we're extracting really is more than you would expect just from randomness. Okay. So let's talk about function a little bit. Um, so this data that we have is functional. I can stimulate the graph. I can stimulate the brain and it sends signals through this and I can then extract information and stuff. Um, but what I want to know is how does the brain determine the stimulus it's received based upon the response that has happened? So what happens is if you take a brain and you give it some stimulus, you show it a rabbit. Uh, this causes the, the the eyes register the rabbit, goes up the um, up the, the the thingy that connects to your brain. The, I'm having a momentary mind blank of what that word is, um, and connects to the brain, sends some signals into the brain that fires, that sends then signals through the brain, and then eventually your brain goes, ah, okay, I've seen a rabbit. Okay, so how does the brain work this out? How does it know? Because all the all it really has is a sequence of firings. From the sequence of neurons firing, it then deduces this thought of, okay, this is a rabbit. But the only information it has is neuronal firing. So how does it determine it's seen in a rabbit from the firings that it gets? So we want to try and see if we can do something similar. Can we look at the neurons that fire in the brain to work out what stimulus was given to the brain at the start? Okay. And again, we're going to use the blue brain circuit to do this. And we have uh, some spike data on this. But this is a sub-circuit of the thing I did before. So this only has 30,000 neurons. It's a slightly older version of the blue brain circuit. And again, we treat it as a directed graph, neurons of vertices, synapses or edges. And what we're going to do is going to select some champion vertices. So I'm going to say these vertices are key to the structure just by using structural information. I'm going to say these vertices are important vertices. They're going to tell me a lot about the function and how we choose these I'll come to in a second. We're going to take the neighborhood of these vertices. We then look at the functional data on these neighborhoods and we apply some kind of function that takes the functional data from here and outputs just a real number. And then we stick that real number into a vector um, and then feed this into a feature vector and we feed this into a support vector machine and we do some classification stuff. Okay. So let me explain these steps a little bit more. So the champion selection, what we do here is we use a uh, combinatorial or topological um, properties of the neighborhood of that vertex to then extract a value. Okay. So we, again, it's kind of a map that takes each, each vertex and gives a real number to that vertex. Um, so one example is just take the size of the neighborhood. So how many how many neighbors does this connect to? It's a very simple metric. We could take the Euler characteristic of the directed flag complex of the neighborhood. So you take the vertex, take all its neighbors. This is a graph. Take the flag complex, take the Euler characteristic. Uh, the normalized Betty coefficient. Um, this is similar to the Euler characteristic, except that instead of alternating the Betty numbers, we just sum them. But we also weight them in a way that gives higher preference to the higher dimensions because we want the higher dimensions. We think the higher dimensions capture more important information. And the weighting we do here has some theory behind it to justify why we weight it in this way. Uh, density coefficient. This is the number of cliques, k plus one cliques divided by the number of cliques, or the number of k simplices divided by the number of k minus one simplices. And this is kind of a measure of how tightly connected the, simplicity, the flag complex is. Is this a series of kind of spread out simplices or, or, or are all these simplices highly connected to each other? And this kind of measures this. And it can, can be said as a generalization of the clustering coefficient, which is an existing metric in graph theory that basically takes the number of triangles um, divided by the number of possible triangles. Okay, so the number of three cliques divided by the number of possible three cliques. Um, and Possible triangles is essentially when we have two edges that we could add an edge there or we don't. And that's roughly what we mean by possible triangles. And the TCC here is just a directed version of this. Um, the number of bidirectional edges. So neurons can connect to each other. You can have a neuron that connects to this one and then connects to the back to that one. And actually, this is a very important structure within the brain that we'll come back to towards the end. 
um, but just counting the number of these reciprocal edges is a one metric we can use. And then the final one here are some kind of just spectral parameters that we can use. So just based upon the adjacency matrix, we can do some spectral stuff. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the 50 highest values of our neighborhood. So we have 30,000 neurons. We can compute all of these values for all of the 30,000 neurons. And then we take the neurons with the 50 highest of these values. And these are going to be our champions. So here's an example. Uh, here's a small toy graph with six vertices. And we can compute all of these values for all of these six things. Okay, so take, for example, size. The size of zero is four. There's zero itself and then three neighbors. Okay, the Euler characteristic of that is when we take all of these four neighbors and we compute the Euler characteristic of this thing. Okay, and we get zero in that case, it's contracted. Um, but we can do this for all of these things. Um, so suppose I want to take one champion and I'm going to use size as my selection parameter. So I take the vertex with the highest neighborhood, which in this case is vertex three. Um, or I could say, okay, I want to take two champions and I'm going to use the clustering coefficient. Okay, then three, two, and four have the highest value here. So I take two and four as my champions. Or I could take the smallest values. It doesn't have to be the biggest values. I could say, okay, I want the two with the smallest normalized Betty coefficient, in which case this is two and three. So this is the idea. Okay, but we're going to do it on the big 30,000 vertex graph. Uh, the featureization step works like this. Okay, here's, here's all of our data. So we have the six neurons, and there's a dot when they fire across this time. The time runs for roughly 200 milliseconds. We throw away the first 10 milliseconds because that's when the input's coming and we don't want to capture that. We want to capture the response. And then we take the next 50 milliseconds and then the next 50 milliseconds. So we consider two time bins here. And then we take the neighborhood of, the, of our champions. So this is the neighborhood of our champion number two. And then we look at which neurons in this region fire within this time bin. Okay, so we can see that the red ones here are the firing things from this neighborhood in this time bin. So it's neuron one and neuron three, but two doesn't. So we just take the one and three and the graph induced by that. Okay, and then we look at the second time bin and we can see actually one, two, and three all fire in this time bin. So we take the whole thing. And then we look at this champion neighborhood over here. Um, we can see that four, three, and five all fire in time bin one, but in time bin two, only three and four fire, not five. So we just take the three and the four. Okay, and then we choose one of our featureization functions. And actually, the featureization function here is just exactly the same as the function I chose you before, but now applied to the red graph. Okay, so suppose I take size, I could take Euler characteristic of this, uh, of the red stuff, I could take clustering coefficient of the red stuff, any of this kind of stuff. But I just take size here. So then I end up with a feature vector two, three, three, two. That has two things in it, that has three, that has three, that has two. Okay, so this is a vector of numbers, and I can feed this then into some machine learning algorithm that I want to do some classification. So here's the algorithm that we use. So we have two time bins, and we select 50 neighborhoods. So we have a feature of length of 100. So we have 100 real numbers in the vector. The functional data that we had, we had eight different stimuli that we feed in. And each of those is put in about 550 times. So this gives us 4,400 feature vectors. We use 60% of those for training the machine, and then we use 40% for classifying. And here's the output we get. So the highest value we get is 88%. So we have all of these possible selection parameters for choosing our champions, and then the same parameters for doing our featureization step as well. Um, and the biggest value we get is 88. And you can see this is when we use the CLSG radius. So this is one of the Laplacian things, the Chung Laplacian spectral gap radius. Um, and the best feature thing is just size. So this is the number of things in that neighborhood that fire. Okay. But let me throw away a bunch of these because a bunch of them are useless and don't really work very well. And here are the ones that I talked about before. Okay. And you see 88 is the highest one we get. And what's interesting here is size is the best, but actually the second best here is Euler characteristic. So Euler characteristic is a really good way of capturing the functional data in this neighborhood. It does nearly as well as size. But actually it's interesting that size, which is perhaps the simplest, seems to do the best. And sometimes all the characteristic is better. So you get 85 there versus 84. Um, and in terms of selection parameters, this tends to vary a lot, and it, it really does vary what you want, what you want to what you want to find. And one open question we have is why does this one work? And I have no idea. What is it about this metric that is extracting key information about the structure of the graph um, that explains how the function of the brain is working? Okay, so that's some functional stuff. Okay, I have a few more minutes. I want to talk briefly about reliability. So the idea of reliability is 
that the brain is very reliable, but it's also very efficient. Okay? And I'm not going to define these words very well, but what I mean roughly by reliability is that if a few neurons in your brain die, your brain carries on working. If a few synapses break, it carries on working. If I go out and drink a bunch of wine this evening, which is highly likely, then my brain will still work tomorrow and I'll still be able to understand the talks, hopefully. Um, but it's also very efficient, right? The brain is one of the best machines we have for doing things like image classification or image recognition, right? It's really good at recognizing patterns and stuff compared to supercomputers that fill vast warehouses cooled by glacial lakes and all this kind of stuff that can only just about do the same kind of stuff. And yet we fit it in our head. Okay, so it's very efficient at what it does, but it's also very reliable. You can damage it and it can do it. Um, and how do we justify what we mean by efficient versus reliable here? And by efficient, roughly, we mean that it doesn't have any more edges than it needs. It doesn't have any extra synapses. It sends exactly the information it gets to the place it needs to go. Okay, But this is almost the opposite of reliable, because if one of these breaks, then the whole thing stops working. So it's reliable if it has lots of routes that take it from kind of one input to somewhere else. Okay, If this, this synapse here breaks, then I could go a different route. I could go up here and along here instead. Okay, it's reliable. But this isn't very efficient. It's sending information to different places than it needs to go um, because it means that if one breaks, it will still get where it needs to go, but it's wasting some of the information. Okay, So this is kind of what we mean by the difference between uh, reliable versus efficient. Um, and if we capture this in this way, so this picture up here, this is the number of neurons, the percentage of the neighborhood of these that we need to capture the um, the size of the dimension. So you can think of the information stored in this neighborhood sits in some dimensional space, where each neuron is a zero and one in that dimension, essentially a vector of Rn, right? How much of these neurons do we need in order to capture some percentage of that dimensionality? Okay, so it turns out that you only need 25% of the neurons for the efficient, so the, um, the colors here have been switched just to keep you on your toes. So the purple here is actually the sparse one. So that's the blue over here. Um, so if you have 25% of your sparse neighborhood, then you actually capture 90% of the dimensionality of the data that you could, you could store. Whereas if you have 75, you need 75% of the neighborhood of the dense one in order to capture 90% of the information of that dimensionality. Okay? So the, the sparse ones, they need less of their neighborhood to, to hold more data. Um, and this thing on the right is saying essentially the same thing. And down here, we fed this into the functional stuff that I talked about a minute ago, the classification that we were doing. And if instead of just selecting your champion, you first select the sparse neighborhoods, and then you use one of your selections to champion, then you get much better classification results. So the blue stuff here is the sparse pre-selections. What I mean is I take the neighborhoods that are sparse, so the ones that are like this, and for some notion of sparseness, and then I apply the algorithm that I just talked about for functional classification. And you consistently get better classification results if you select the sparse ones here. So these are efficient. They're better at storing the data that we have. Okay. Um, now, I can define kind of this notion in terms of, I haven't really defined what I mean by sparse or reliable here. Right? I said that uh, or efficient versus reliable. I've said this one is sparse, so that's reliable. Uh, and this one is a, is a thing. And there's two, two kind of structural properties that I link to these things. One is reciprocal edges. So connections like this are very good for being reliable because they you can send information both ways. It increases the communication between this neighborhood. But they're not very efficient because if you have one neuron here, one neuron here firing and they're connected by an edge, every time this fires, it sends it here and it sends it back to here. And you're sending your information in an infinite loop, not really progressing anywhere. So it's not very efficient, but it is very reliable. And the other thing is cliques, right? So how dense is the simplicial complex? If you think about the flag complex, is this kind of a um, is this a dense uh, simplicial complex or is it more sparse? If it's dense, then I have lots of routes through the simplicial complex that I can get my information from here to here. Whereas if it's more spread out, there's only certain ways it can get through, but it's more efficient because it has to go this way, it has to go this way. It's not sending voltage. You know, this is a little bit abstract. There's not this the exact definition of how we're sending voltage through simplicial complexes, but this kind of thing. Okay, so I claim that um, reciprocal edges and Cliques are the two things that quantify structurally this idea of efficient versus reliable. Um, and one of the open questions here we have is how do we 
again, get a control model for this. How does this relationship between reciprocal connections and cliques behave? Because if you add in a reciprocal connection into your graph, you're going to create more cliques, right? More directed cliques, because you now have multiple options about this. But actually, this is a very interesting combinatorial question of how adding in reciprocal connections affects this clique thing. Uh, and so in order to understand the appropriate control models we can have for this, we need to better understand how adding in reciprocal connections affects the number of cliques. And actually, this is then closely linked to post, uh, linear extensions of post sets. So there's some really interesting combinatorics going on behind the scenes there. Um, but again, the problem comes down to appropriate control models for what we want. Uh, so to finish up um, some future work, so we've done this structural analysis on kind of this blue brain data set, which is a model, but and we've ran a little bit of it on C. elegans and Drosophila, but can we do it to some of the other data sets? So uh, you got the Drosophila adults, uh, microns, which is a very recent data set that came out, which is um, some electron micro microscopy of a rat brain. Um, and can we do the same kind of analysis to this? We run into some issues. So Drosophila adult has some very high degree neurons, which messes with some of our code and makes the analysis very difficult. Um, but still, this is kind of work we're working. Um, I mentioned how can we normalize the rich club? So I really think this rich club captures some key information about how these cliques link together within the circuit, more so than just the normal rich club. But we really need an appropriate control model in order to use this efficiently. Um, and what other topology can we use? There's some really nice topology, right? You guys have all done lots of nice theoretical stuff, but how can we use this to extract data from these data sets? In terms of the functional stuff, um, can we do this to other data sets? So we applied this to the brain. Can we apply it to other neuroscience data, some of these other connectomes? We have certain issues here in that these ones are not really functional. We mostly just have the structural data here. There are some functional models, but... Again, like I say, you, to get this data, you have to cut open the brain. So you don't really get the functional stuff that you do in the same way as the models. Um, but can we also apply it to non-neuroscientific? So other data sets with this notion of kind of data traveling through a graph, you can apply this idea into that. Can we do the same kind of thing? Um, we didn't really do any fancy machine learning here. We just were more interested in developing the method for extracting kind of the feature vectors. So getting rid of the noise, the dimensionality reduction that we did. Uh, but how high could we make this accuracy go if we use some better techniques? Um, and the final thing which I alluded to is um, why do the certain parameters work better? Why does the, 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 the um, chung laplace and spectral gap give us the best classification? Um, is there some structural explanation as to why the neighborhoods with this structure link give us better classification? And this leads into the reliability stuff that I was talking about, right? We think sparsity is one thing that makes it really good for classifying, but we really don't have a good me good metric for what we mean by sparse. All right, that's it. Um, these are my collaborators. Uh, these are people from Blue Brain. These were all in Aberdeen. Some of them are here. Um, and these are the two papers. So the first one here is about the structure. The second one is about the functional stuff. Um, there's a GitHub repo here if you want to play around with the functional pipeline and do your own classification. Uh, the reliability stuff should hopefully be done in the next few months. So keep your eye out for that. And that's everything I wanted to talk about. Thanks. So um, you were saying a lot about having the right model to to have a control for, yeah. So so of course this is kind of like, do I understand correctly that that you want to have a very simple random model that captures what you see? So in a sense you have to reproduce what you see, but you don't really want to reproduce what you see, right? Yeah, yeah. This is the key, right? It's uh, how closely can I because. I mean, there's the argument that the brain is really just a random model with very strict rules about how it grows. So the the if you if you recreate exactly those rules, you recreate how the brain grows in itself. So yeah, you you want a random model that kind of controls for certain things. So the key is that if we're trying to understand, for example, this reliability stuff about how these reciprocal edges affect reliability or the sparseness, we want a random model that kind of controls those but allows the other stuff to then go random. Um, 
And if, for example, with the simplicial rich club, we want to fix the number of vertices, the number of simplices that a vertex belongs to, so that we can control that and then let the other stuff go to random. So it really does depend on what we're looking at in each case. Um, but we'd like more options for how we can make random simplicial complexes that fix these things in particular, so that we can then compare the controls there. So yeah, there's there's no kind of single random model that I want. The more because if you look at graphs, for example, there's hundreds of different random models, right? And they fix different things, which allows you to do these nice analysis. But the same scope is just not there for some special complexes. So I don't want just a random model that works for everything. I would like more scope of random models that fix different things so I can control for something. Yeah. Hi, welcome everyone uh, for uh, this afternoon's session of the workshop. It's a pleasure to introduce Leo Bena, uh, which will talk about triangulation uh, and mm. L2 Betty number. Yeah, Betty number, L2 Betty number. Let me try to write the title. Probably it's not the same okay. that I send to you, but um, okay, maybe L2 first Betty number. Um, I, I said something like uh, counting triangles or something like that. So. Triangles. So, so first of all, I, I want to thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be to be here. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that it's a joint work, and we are couple. So the first is Jan Chobet. He's in Nantes. Um, Viet Dong is in Paris, and Thomas Schick is in Göttingen and myself. Um, so um, I'll I'll try with, um, so the first part will contain some motivations and maybe a statement, motivations and a statement of, well, one of the results I want to, to present today. So the motivational part is a bit informal, but it's maybe, I'll try to explain how we came up here with this uh, object we, we I'm going to talk about today. I must say that it it should be other elementary and uh, you, you definitely don't know to don't need to know what L2 stuff is. And uh, at the end probably it's that's why I, the first part of the talk I will I will discuss just the the finite uh, finite uh, dimensional case. So it's without L2, okay, which is, in my opinion, interesting by itself. And in fact, it, the same proof works in the inf infinite dimensional case, and it it can be seen as an introduction to this L2 story. So it's uh, you should think the, the other way around. Maybe at the end you will you will understand something about what what is the intuition behind this uh, L2 L2 invariant. So. Okay, is it readable enough? Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So let's start with the with the motivations. Oh, yeah. I, I should use the button or do it by hand? By hand. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't. Oh, no, no. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Very good. Very good. Um. Okay, so the motivation. So uh, the motivation comes from geometric topology. So if you take a, a um, so sigma, it's a sigma surface. Okay, and you 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 know nothing about the surface. Okay, you okay, it's something like that, and okay, you don't you don't even know the genus, but you have some local information. The local information is that. Here, what you see is um, that uh, the triangles are thin. So you you say th this means that the the curvature kappa is negative everywhere. Okay, so you don't you don't have some local information about how you can move on the surface, and and, um, and you you and you denote by and p will be the set 
of gamma uh, closed geodesics. Um, and you ask that they are uh, prime closed geodesics uh, on on sigma. So closed geodesic is, is just so some some curves uh, somewhere which is minimizing uh, the locally minimizing the the distance on the surface. So you started with the surface with um, um, uh, a metric. Uh, so uh, with uh, with a metric, of course, because uh, the curvature comes from the metric. Okay, and so you just you just know that every everywhere locally you have you are neg negatively curved, and um, you know this set, the set of all closed. So closed means that you come back eventually where where you started from, uh, geodesic that you minimize the, the length locally, and prime means that uh, you you do not take in this set. Uh, twice going twice around the same geodesic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Compact orientable. Compact orientable. And what you know is that um, the the fact which so it's a uh, it, it's a theorem. It's and well, there are several way to to see it, but it's it's how I come in. So if you know the 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 length. Spectrum. Okay, so the length spectrum of this surface with this metric is the set gamma and L of gamma. So this thing, this is the length of the geodesic. Okay, so you just enumerate the geodesics on this surface. So there, there are there are countably many because the the, the negative curvature imposes it. There are con countably many geodesics. You list them and you and for each geodesic you you add the data of its length. So it's a set of uh, no, positive real numbers. And if you know this, the length spectrum, it determines um the genus of of Euler characteristic probably. Well well both, of course, because they are obviously related. It determines the topology of the surface. So at the end, so you didn't you didn't know uh, from the start, and you can recover it rather indirectly, as you will see from this data. It's some kind of inverse problem. So you okay, and um, so my, let me. Okay, the, the first thing to say is that if the if the curvature if every is everywhere minus one, so you have a hyperbolic surface, you can recover it di directly from from what is well, it's it has been known since sixties um, or something like that from something which is called Selbert trace formula. So it's it's some analytic tool which tells you that the, some. So this information it means that this information is contained in the um, in the spectral well in the in the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator on the surface, and this is very proper to the um, to the case of constant negative curvature because well the geodesics and the Laplacian are very related in this setting. In a more general setting, it's so, so, and this implies the theorem. In the more general setting, it was open until um, uh, 2017. And so it, it follows, it follows from the following um, fact. So, uh, so you define, so to see this, you, you introduce this function. So it's, uh, So you introduce a, a, a zeta function, which is a, which comes, which is called a dynamical zeta function, which was introduced by uh, Ruel. And uh, this function is, it's a function of the variable s, and it's a, an infinite product, a product over all the closed geodesics in your surface. And this product is one minus exponential of minus s times the length of gamma. So you cook up a function from this set, 
this is a set I should close it from the length spectrum you you cook up this function and well from dynamical considerations you can see that this product converges at least for real part of s big enough because it makes the exponential ex extremely decreasing and um, and the the theorem which implies the fact in general which is due to so it's due to it was known from freed from the from the 80s for kappa equals minus one but in this case as i told you this fact was already known from in, in fact using similar techniques so the spectrum of the laplacian and it's more recently it's dyatlov and the Borsky. um okay so this is uh more recent and for general uh negatively curved surface and the theorem tells you that this function uh, extends um, as a meromorphic morphic function. So a priori, just an infinite product. So you can see it as a, as a series and uh, well, there is a convergence radius. It, takes, it, it extends meromorphically on the whole plane okay. on, on C. And it's its vanishing order when s equals zero is uh, given by the Euler characteristic of the surface. So this is this uh, what I what I said when when I told you this um, set determines uh, the Euler characteristic indirectly because of course you will never compute the Euler characteristic like that. But well, it's something it's some kind of rigidity that if you know you just know that this set, the, the data of the length of the geodesics of, of the surface, well, it imposes you the topology of the surface. It's probably not too surprising, but it's, it was not known in this generality be, be, before then. So what I want to talk about today is some kind of combinatorial analog of these ideas. So what we do, we take, um, so it's completely general. We take a M, a, a compact uh, oriented ma manifold. In fact, we, we don't really need that it's a manifold. We just need some, well, non-singularity at some play, some weak non-singularity. And with a tau a triangulation. As I, told, as I told you, it will be a combinatorial triangulation of M. And I, when I say triangulation, I really say triangulation. I mean, uh, each, it's, it's, it's simplicial. You, you cannot glue together the simplicity and the, the conversation of this morning. But well, of course, it's, it's harmless. I mean, you, you can always get into it. And the, the definition, so what I want to do, I want to define a, a similar function. So I, I have to tell you what are geodesics in this in this uh, perspective. And so the, the definition is that um, a geodesic path. Okay, it's something that so there is no metric. So you should replace this uh, locally minimizing uh, definition by some combinatorial uh, combinatorial one a geodesic path. So gamma will be. So sigma one, sigma k of length k um, k minus one. Sorry, okay, maybe uh, put a k plus one here. There's a subtlety that it's of length k in so m compact. Uh, of dimension n, let's fix the dimension. Okay, and I will. So in the talk, I, I just the definition is completely general, but uh, I will speak about the n minus one skeleton. So just looking at uh, simplices, n n minus one dimensional simplices. 
so in the case of, of a surface, you recover um, passes in the in the so in the graph in the in the one skeleton. But in general, you are counting. So in dimension three, you are counting. Uh, uh, you are considering passes passes of uh, triangles in the in your triangulation. And so a geodesic path. So it's um, so it's so it's a path where all the simplices are, are adjacent to each other. Of course, so it's a path. And geodesic means that if uh, is is uh, uh, defined by sorry the syntax of this sentence is terrible. Uh, so you want that sigma i and sigma i plus one um, adjacent, of course, and but they I should write it here because it's important. They do not bound the same. And simplex. Okay, so let me let me draw an example. Okay, so maybe okay, let's draw a two-dimensional example. I don't know, I do something a bit random like that. Okay, what I can do. Oh, what I can do with colors. Okay, if I start here, I can go there. And I cannot go there because I bound the center angle. So I can go there. I cannot I can go not go on this. I can keep going here. And here, well, I cannot go back still. I can go there. Okay, and then I'm, I'm stuck, for instance. So this is an example. Okay, and what will be forbidden is uh, something like that. Forbidden. Okay, so in some sense, it's geodesic because at, at each step, if you do that, you sh you could have done have done it faster. So it makes sense. But in fact, there is a good reason to 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 draw this uh, too. To put this definition, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, they share. Um, they share um, n minus two uh, simplex. Thank you. The, so, the, so they they do not share a, um, a higher dimensional simplex, but they share a lower dimensional simplex. Okay. Thank you for the the question. Okay, and then I, I look at this. So it's my new my new set P. P is a set of gamma closed geodesic. Okay, so closed means that the the, the last uh, guy here is adjacent to sigma one, but of course it adjacent but do not bound the same n dimension. Okay. Closed geodesic in uh, so n minus one in the n minus one skeleton. Okay. And I ask prime again. So in my set P, I don't consider running several times around the same geometric path. Okay. And there is a um, so there is a sign. So Maybe I write it here in small. There is a sign epsilon of gamma, which comes from the orientation. Everything is oriented from the from the beginning uh, triangulation of M. Uh, everything are uh, everything oriented. Oriented. And now, when you run along the path, so maybe sometimes you run against the orientation of the of the simplex 
well. You can do it. Each time you run against the, the orientation, you count minus one. Each each time you run in the right sense, you count plus one, and you take the product. OK? So it's the, 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 at the end, the sign tells you that somehow you well, you you went consistently or or not around your your geodesic. And the, the theorem. Oh. Me with the, the the other guys, is that this zeta function associated to the triangulation, which is a some kind of analog of the real data function in this setting. It's some kind of analog, but you have a sign here, and you take Z to the length of gamma, so maybe, okay, uh, maybe I fucked up here. Yeah, I fucked up here, it's like that, okay. It's like that, but when you close, it does not mean that sigma k equals sigma one. It means that sigma k is adjacent, and it's like that. And this is the number of uh, simply simplices in uh, in the in gamma. So it's the length, it's the combinatorial length, and you take this product, and the theorem tells you that it converges for small modulus of v. Uh, it extends uh, and uh, and equals a polynomial. So in this setting, it's it's a very simple function. In fact, this it's an uh, a priori it's an, uh, an infinity series, on, and it's not. It's not defined on the whole plane. It's defined on a small disk, a convergence disk. And in fact, on this disk, it can be re uh, rewritten as a, as a polynomial, just as, um, uh, I don't know, one divided by one minus x is this series on the disk of radius one. Okay, so it's a polynomial uh, where, on, uh, where it converges. Okay, so it converges somewhere. And in fact, it can be extended as a polynomial. Well, where it does not converge, and um, and so when you identify both, now you can look at special values of this function, and it vanishes at v equals one divided by n plus two with order uh, b one of the manifold, so the first Betty number. Okay, so the the um, the analogy is that now, if you know your manifold, the triangulation, and the data of all the closed geodesics, prime closed geodesics in the triangulation with their lengths, you can recover the first Betty number of the manifold. Okay, so of course at this point you sh you could argue that if you know a triangulation of M, you can recover the first Betty number by simpler means. And uh, and that's true. Uh, that's why maybe what is interesting in this um, in this perspective is that you can play the same game with L two invariant. And for this, it's much more complicated. And you can play some other game that I won't talk about today. With, for instance, a linking number of nodes, and maybe some more that I don't know yet how to do. But Okay, let's do this this simple example of the first bit number so that I can describe to you the, the strategy and how it goes because it's, as I told you, completely elementary. And then I'll go to the to the L2 L2 part. So to 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 do that we 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 mimic a bit the um, some part of the of the proof that I alluded to before. So we we look at some combinatorial analog of the of the Laplace operator for the for the surface, what I was describing before. This combinatorial analog is a is a is a Laplacian of the of the triangulation. 
and uh, and will the the theorem will follow from some kind of trace formula for this operator, which is a matrix in the finite dimensional case, and the trace formula is just uh, an explicit computation. So it's very nice to, to it's much simpler now. So let's start with um, combinatorial Laplacian. Okay, so I have the so let me denote by pi of tau is a vector space generated by uh, high dimensional simplices in the triangulation, of course, and um, and there is a um, So the combinator, the combinatorial Laplacian is a matrix delta, which goes from C i of tau to itself, and it takes um, and it's defined like that. It's let me write the formula, and I will let you know who is with, uh, with who there. So this matrix is given by so it's something usual. You you have you have your your complex okay, and this complex comes with a with a well with a boundary operator here di i d i dot one di Okay, and the, the boundary operator is just you take your simplex and you consider the boundary with signs come okay, everybody you all know how you compute the signs. And uh, and this star is um is um so formally it's the it's the um, adjoint of this of this operator, so it goes in the other way around. But you can, I can tell you explicitly with the, with this adjoint. I mean, so when you take the boundary of a simplex, it's, it's the sum with signs of simplices bounding your your simplex. The distar of the simplex is the sum with signs of the simplices in which your simplex, in the boundary of which your simplex lies. So maybe let me draw an example. So of course, so the boundary of this is this okay with signs and now the d star of so let me this red uh, person is exactly uh, the okay. both come with signs Okay, and so when you when you act uh, by d d star and d star d, you go back and forth, back and forth, and you stay in there. And this is the com the the, anal the analog of the of the Laplacian in, in this setting, and you can compute it completely explicitly. Let's compute it. Compute it well, at least on an example. But in fact, it's. Well, it's not difficult to turn it uh, in in a proof that so and so you have to compute bo both paths. So let me let me try a well a, a two dimensional example like that. Okay. So here is E, and let's compute. First, d d star of e in red, so it should be a combination of of um, of uh, edges in the so of simplices in the one dimensional skeleton. And so first, I take d star of e. So d star of e is this guy coming with. So I have to take conventions for the sign. So I just give you the conventions. It's 
at the end, is, you just have to, to be consistent. So I take this one is a plus, this one with a minus. This is d star of e. And then I take the, the Bundai. So the Bundai you run uh, in the, in the um, counterclockwise. So, OK, this is, this is d of the plus part of d star of e. And here I run in the other direction. And this means it comes twice in the linear combination. Okay, so this is d d star of e, and let me do the same for the, the other part, but on another picture, oh, well, with another color, it will be enough, I mean. So now let me compute d star d of e in blue. So I start with, with e, I take e, uh, I take the, the boundary, so this comes with minus, this comes with plus, and then I take d star of this Bondari, and so one way to 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 okay then I, sorry then I take this of this Bondari and this this star of the of the Bondari is the um, all the incident uh, edges so and I have to check the signs so here you have to go out because it's a minus and here you have to come. So uh, out and here you come in, in, in. Okay. And as you can see, there are compensations here. This, this guy disappear, and you you just what just survive. And let me emphasize. So here, here you have four. I can. So the white one was just the notation, and here you have this one, and this one. Okay. So what happened? It happened that you have a certain uh, factor from the identity in this matrix. And then you take just the neighbors that are incident adjacent to E, but do not bound a common uh, complex. So it's exactly the, the definition of uh, geodesics in the triangulation that I gave. And that's why, that's why we took the, this definition, I mean, because we want to fit with this computation and it's uh, I mean it's a proposition it's not just a, an example so proposition the delta is so n plus two times identity so here uh, n was uh, equal to two it's a dimension of the of the surface here it was for a surface uh, minus some matrix t and this matrix t is some adjacency matrix that just counts so in this matrix, there is the, the, the T of E is one plus or minus one, just if you are adjacent to E, but not sharing a common, um, a common uh, simplex. Where, so let me write something for T. T sigma so equals zero if sigma so uh, none adjacent or share a common n complex and t sigma so equals plus or minus one otherwise and otherwise is exactly this and for the sign you have to be careful I I, I won't be able to to be precise with the signs right there in front of you, but well, you have to keep track of the signs. And so this sign gives the gives the epsilon at the end. So and the lemma is that you can compute the the, the trace of this matrix T. So that's why I told you. We'll we'll use some kind of trace formula, and the trace of this matrix T. It's well, it's well known from well people doing combinatorics and graphs, for instance. So if you if you already saw a graph Lapl uh, graph Laplacian, it's uh, the graph Laplacian is the sum of uh, all the neighbors for um, vertex. So it will be the the first one.
And so the following lemma is that the, you can compute. So if you take this, you iterate this matrix T, so what are the, the entries of T are zero, but at some places it's one. And when it's one, it means that um, the basis element that you pair with this uh, entry are related as we want, the, are related, so adjacent, but not bonding. Uh, in place. So if I iterate it and I take the trace, so I look at the diagonal entries. So what I will see in the diagonal is um, is, uh, is some product. Well, you, you have to write down, so let me write it down. Uh, OK. Let me write it down before I state the lemma. So if I take this power and I take uh, a diagonal entry of the power of this matrix, so it will be a sum of a sigma 1, sigma k minus 1. And the sum is sigma sigma 1. So the, the entry of t uh, relating uh, the, the simplex I started with, with this sigma 1, t sigma 1, sigma 2, t sigma k minus 1, sigma. OK, so it's just what happens when you when you take this power of the matrix and you look at the diagonal element. And now the lemma that the trace of t of k, and the, the proof is there, as you will see, is just the sum for gamma a closed geodesic of length k. For the moment, uh, I do not add prime. I will add prime on the, on the next uh, line of epsilon of gamma length of gamma sharp, where gamma sharp, I lost my color. Oh, here. Where this is the underlying prime Geodesic. Okay, so maybe maybe here I take non-prime geodesics, but I just consider the length of the un underlying prime. And why do you have this formula? Because you, you just look at this. So this is a product of plus and minus ones along the path gamma. So you take gamma is so how it comes. You take gamma equals sigma sigma 1, sigma k minus 1. OK, this is the closed path gamma that you take here. If every everybody here, here is not 0, otherwise, of course, it's 0. If everybody here is not 0, it means that you have such a closed path. And the, the product here is the product of plus of minus 1, so it gives you the epsilon. OK, and now why, why do you have this? Because when you take the trace, you, you, you run over all the simplices Sigma, in particular, there are this number of simplices in this geodesic path, but ju just you change the bath point. Okay, so it's the same geodesics that you count here, but instead of starting from sigma, you start it from sigma one, then sigma two, then sigma k, k, k minus one. Okay, so this is the this is the proof of this formula. And the second step is now we we want to. Um, transform a bit this computation into a computation involving prime geodesics. But of course, it's not far because it's what comes here. And this is a sum. And now you take gamma. Uh, you cannot read uh, when I write here. It's too, OK, let me, sorry. Yeah. yeah. This is a, also a sum for gamma in P. So P means closed prime. Geodesic. Okay. And um, okay, so I sum over gammas. Now, now gamma sharp is gamma because I just take prime. And now I have to repeat them because maybe I run several times. And this makes it's a sum over P such that P times 
the length, length of gamma is k. Okay, so this is just a refor reformulation of this one, but instead of summing over all the geodesics, I just sum over, over, the, over, over the prime one, and then I iterate the number of times I have to run to get the length k. P is the number. P is the number. Okay, and this P is the number such that P times the length of the primitive geodesic is K. So it's the, 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 this length was K, this length, is, this is the, the primitive. Okay, so this is the trace formula we were gonna use. And now the, the proof is very simple. So you, you take the, what you consider is the, the characteristic polynomial of the matrix T, this transfer matrix here, and you compute it with, uh, with the help of, so first what you do here, you write, so, so you use this formula that tells you that the log of the determinant is the trace of the log. Okay, and so you, you rewrite, and of course you, so let's rewrite it first. You rewrite it as exponential of Okay, so it's purely formal, and to make it not formal, you have to ask that z is not too big. So z should be smaller than one over the spectral radius of t, so that this is um, in a, so, so that the log uh, converges. And since it, well, it's, it's well defined, now you can expand it. So I just expand the, the series of the log. Okay, so it's v to the k, trace of t to the k. Uh, and I, I enter the trace because it's linear, uh, divided by k. Okay, this is the expansion of the log. Um, and now I use the, the lemma. V to the k divided by k, and here it's the sum of our prime geodesics of v to the, uh, sorry, of gamma sum p gamma equals k. I just copy what is there. Epsilon of gamma to the p, okay? So I just replace the trace by the, the formula of the lemma. And then I, 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 sh I should, um, oh, this is bigger than one. And the, now I want to permute the sums here and observe that when I sum over all k, I can instead sum over all p's and write that k is p times gamma. Okay, so. so this is, so first I sum over the geodesics and then I, have, I still have the length of gamma here and now I, as I told you, I, I prefer to sum over all p's, okay, here, and I have to replace, so now it's z, k is p times gamma, so it's z times, z to the power of p length of gamma. Still, I have epsilon of gamma to the p, and I divide by k, which is p times gamma. So I can sim simplify this, and then I see, uh, I see some, uh, I see something here. So let me take this out. I have the exponential of minus this sum, and this is a, this is a, again a log, right is there. So I take the sum out, it's a product. 
okay? And I have exponential of minus this sum, but this sum is a log. So I come with, uh, so let me write it. Exponential of minus sum over p, v to the p gamma, epsilon of gamma to the p divided by p. And this is exactly one minus epsilon of gamma v to the gamma. Oh, sorry. So this is the, the end of it. Well, it's just a computation. I expanded the log, I manipulated a bit, and I refactored the log, and well, okay, just nothing, nothing too fancy. So what what I proved here is that this uh, this is my uh, my zeta function. So it's I proved the first part of the theorem that it converges for z small enough, and in fact, I gave you the the disk. It's z smaller than the um, the spectral radius is smaller that, than the inverse of the largest eigenvalue of t. Okay, so it converges. And in fact, it's a polynomial. It's a characteristic polynomial of this matrix t. And now to, to make the Betty number appear, it's just because I can rewrite this uh, determinant on the other hand. This determinant, I can write it as so. I take the okay. I take the z out, so it comes with the dimension of the space. So this is an integer, is the dimension of the vector space uh, c n minus one, and uh, and then the determinant of one over z identity minus t, okay? And I can rewrite it. Now I, I, use, the, um, I use the proposition. The proposition which told me, but I erased it, that the, um, this combinatorial Laplacian can be written as a multiple of the identity, so n plus two times the identity. Oh yeah, thank you. The proposition is there. I use this proposition. And then what comes is z to the c n minus one tau. Determinant of one minus z n plus two divided by z identity minus delta now. Okay, so what I see is that now I transform it into the some the characteristic polynomial of delta, the Laplacian. Evaluated at the value uh, one minus uh, z n plus two divided by z. In particular, when z equals one over n plus two, this vanishes, and this the value of this function at z equal one over minus two is just the multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue of delta. When z equals n plus two, uh, this is the multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue of delta. And this is equals to, uh, so it's the dimension of the kernel and the kernel of this operator by, well, easy uh, linear algebra. The kernel of this operator is just the, well, it's, it has the dimension of the um, of the homology n minus one homology group. So this is b n minus one of m. Okay, and it's also b one of m, and it's true that I I wrote it b with b one because I find it uh, well, I'm more comfortable with b one, but it's they are the same by Poincaré duality. Okay, so this is the proof of this theorem. I told you it's quite elementary. Well, it, it took me a while, but uh, so I have what a bit less than ten minutes, forty-five. Yes, with yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, and so let me 
let me say something about what you can do in some more general case. So namely, you take, uh, you don't take, um, you, re you, well, you try to remove the compactness. So the triangulation is not finite anymore and everything because it becomes more complicated, of course. So the non-compact case. It's not really non-compact because I, I cannot deal with uh, uh, arbitrary non-compact manifold. I will deal with the universal cover of compact manifolds, which is very spe specific non-compact manifold. So you take so take m tilde the universal cover of m and lift so to so tilde a triangulation of m tilde. So what you what you see is something like that. So you maybe you have a I don't know. So, okay. Okay, you have a this triangulation of a torus. So you identify some of the of the edges and what you see there is something like that okay and so you lift and you have triangles everywhere and so you leave the triangulation and you you fix a preferred lift okay and you fix it you, you for each um simplex here you fix a preferred lift here so of course you can do it like that But you're not forced to. You could do something uh, stupid. Okay, no problem. So you fix this preferred lift, and what you say now is that the p the p tilde is the set of geodesics in uh, the n minus one skeleton of tau tilde, containing uh, one of the lifts sigma tilde okay so this is sigma this is sigma tilde here in the red box so i'm just counting closed primitive closed primitive geodesics in the triangulation in the universal cover but i want that this it it pass it passes through this preferred lift because otherwise it's um, everything is inf infinite of course okay Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and now I have the same uh, delta defined in the same way. I put a little two here because now it's a it's a inf infinite infinite dim dimensional operator, I, and it acts on this vector space, which is a C, let's say n minus one again of the tilde and well this is the vector space it's generated by the 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 all the lists of the cells but well I, I i can turn it into a hilbert spaces and i want to turn it into a hilbert spaces so, so i put a little two here and it means that i allow some um some infinite uh, chains but i want that the um, that the it uh, converges in the l2 L2 norm. So you have a basis. The basis are the are the are the simplices, and you can take some infinite infinite sums. But the sum of the square of the coefficient should converge. This is the meaning of two. It's just well, you want a Hilbert space. You want a scalar product, which is uh, obvious uh, obviously defined by the basis, and you want that it's closed. Okay, so it acts like that, and still. Still, uh, delta two is uh, n plus two identity minus t, and t is the same matrix. Everything is local. I mean, the matrix you take a simplex in the universal cover, and and it gives you zero everywhere, and just one or minus one 
if uh, the same condition as before are satisfied. So everything goes the same instead that except that you have uh, infinite, infinite dimensional um, stuff. And all these operators, delta, t, are equivalent with respect to the action of the phi one. This means that, in other words, everything is extremely symmetric. If you translate by the action of the fundamental group of the universal cover, everything looks the same everywhere, which is completely obvious if you think uh, from the uh, cover in theory perspective. Okay, and the question is, uh, what can you do with the fundamental lemma that the trace of this operator counts some geodesic? So what does it mean, the trace? And how can you count the geodesic? So the, the problem, trace is not uh, uh, defined. And to convince yourself, you can think that if you if you want to take the trace of uh, the, the, the trace of some any oper well let's say t but any operator p which is equivalent, it should be zero or infinite. It's so the the it's because this will be defined as the sum of a sigma of t sigma sigma, but because of the equivalence, each time you have a non-zero coefficient on the diagonal here, you will have non-zero coefficient on the wall, uh, the, all the translates, so uh, if uh, the fundamental group is inf infinite. Okay, which is the case I'm interested in because otherwise everything is compact and I stay in the same picture. And if this coefficient on the diagonal is not zero, you will have infinitely many coefficients because of the equivalence. So gamma uh, t of gamma uh, sigma, gamma sigma will be equal of t sigma sigma. And so you will add up infinitely many times the same number. So it cannot converge or the operator is zero everywhere and then the trace is zero. Okay, so this is bad. And this is why you introduce the first ingredient of the theory of L2 invariant, and I hope it's a good motivation, and I'm almost done. It's a von Neumann, von Neumann phrase. And this is completely stupid. The idea is that, of course, if you take sigma and all the translates, you will repeat the same procedure. But well, I just, I don't take the sum over all the sigmas, I just take the sum of the, on the fundamental domain. And it's enough because I know that out of the fundamental domain, I will repeat the same coefficients. So all the information is carried here. And the fun, so fundamental trace of tk, or any operator of t, is just the sum of a sigma i tilde uh, lifts, a preferred lift. Preferred lift, so in, in red, I put it here, in red, uh, in red in the picture, of t sigma i sigma i. So I don't sum about the whole diagonal, but I pick an element in each block in the diagonal which are similar. But of course, this matrix is not a copy of uh, around the uh, of the uh, on the fundamental group of the same blocks as in the finite dimensional case. Because if you go there, you can you something will happen when you go far. I mean, it's not like and in particular, what comes here at the end it, it was it, it's that when you take the lemma the, the, the when you take the the trace of the powers of this of this operator still you are counting geodesics for the very same reason here but the, ge, the geodesics on the universal cover that es escape and come back and there are much less geodesics here than geodesics here because for, for instance here you can do something like that you go there and you come back here, it's a closed geodesic. But here, you escape. You never come back if you do that. So there are much less uh, closed geodesics on the universal cover. So you can't, you're counting something different. And then you apply the same game. And what you obtain, and I will finish here, the theorem. Sorry. Is that with this new Zeta function. Oh, sorry. I just have to introduce one last thing. So, and with this trait, you can say that the you can introduce uh, the L two beta number. It's what I should do at some point. So, B two k of m is the 
it's the trace of the identity matrix restricted to the kernel of delta k2. Okay, I can define the trace of an operator. This is an operator. I, I project the space on the kernel and I take the trace, this trace. And this gives me a number, which is, it's a bit confusing, but it's, it's a real number because you don't need to be generated by a set of elements in the basis. When you project on a closed surface space, something weird can happen, but you can define a dimension this is the analogous of the dimension, and this will be the l 2 number. And now I can state the theorem, and I finish there. So this function, V, so it's the same function, e tilde one minus epsilon gamma z to the gamma. It converges till for z small enough, and it extends. But of course, it it won't it will not extend uh, the polynomial now because we are in the in, in, infinite dimensional world. It extends as an analytic function as an analytic function. On uh, the disk of uh, center zero and of radius one over n plus two. Okay. And so it, it extends in the interior and under some hypothesis that I won't have time to say too much about, but if this operator is determinant less. So conjecturally, all the all the such Laplacians are determinant less, but it's not known. It's known for a large class of groups, well, uh, any reasonable groups. Then uh, the value of tilde of z when z um, equals uh, so this boundary value, so it's defined on a, on a disk on zero, and you want to approach this boundary value and see what the function does here. Still, you have a, well, you can say, and it behaves as a S minus one over N plus two, V, sorry, N plus two, to the power B1 of, B1 L2 of M. So still the, the vanishing order is given by the, by the first L2 bit number. And I'll stop here. Sorry for being late. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, in the beginning, uh, we started with a, a surface with negative curvature, and uh, maybe I missed, uh, but uh, in your combinatorial model, is there is not the this analog of the, the, there is no hypothesis. Oh, okay. So it's much well in some sense it, it's weaker because it's much more data. I mean, you need a triangulation. You need well, but uh, but there is no hypothesis on the on the geometry of the of the manifold. Okay. This, this is true. Okay, thank you. So uh, with uh, these ge geodesics, which are one dimensional, you recover this one dimensional holes of M, which is the Betty number. Do you think there's a hope for high dimensional detection with, so, I don't know. So, the, the, so the, the joke is that what we do, but uh, the question is a very good question. What we do with, uh, co-dimension co -dimension one geodesics, we recover co-dimension one first Betty number, which is equal to the first Betty number by duality. And uh, for the other ranks, uh, there is no hope because this is not true. Uh, because what comes here 
is completely it's a particular case of the co-dimension one situation and it's because when you do when i did the computation you saw it in the computation it, in fact there is a two uh, the two the two comes because if if i take a co-dimension one one simplex it always bounds exactly two n-dimensional simplex simplices and this is false if you take a smaller simplices you can have a lot of if you take a vertex you can have a lot of adjacent edges and the other one n it tells you that if i take a n-dimensional simplex it has n vertices in its boundary and this is always true but you what you would have here is at each it's not a multiple of identity it's a diagonal matrix and each coefficient is n plus the adjacency value of your simplex and you need a multiple of identity to make the computation work thank you Uh, what if this last computation you have some sort of um, constant degree in the lower one? Then well, it would then it would work, but uh, it's a very 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 strong assumption. I mean, it, it, you want that it exists a triangulation of a manifold where in dimension k, for instance, mm -hmm. any k simplex bounds exactly the same number d of k plus one. Uh, I, so it is in the boundary of exactly D um, K plus one dimensional simplices. So it's it's a hypothesis that comes out of nowhere. I have no idea how you could uh, prove that this exists in general. For surfaces, there are some stuff, but well, for surfaces, we already, well, you the, the, so you have B1 and B0 and B2, you don't care too much because of and um, for surfaces, there are some stuff about the existence of regular tiling of surfaces, mm -hmm. and these are these are already uh, hard questions. So in uh, higher dimensional, in higher dimension, I have no idea. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are any more que if there are not any more questions, let's thank Leo again. Okay. Uh, welcome again. Uh, we restart with Celeste Damiani, which is a pleasure to have here, which will talk about how to use topological data analysis for breast cancer risk assessment. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, here we are going really to the applications part of this conference. Um, the work that I'm going to present uh, was born in the framework of a project funded by uh, Cancer Research UK, which aimed originally at developing and evaluating um, algorithms for uh, assessing the risk of breast cancer in healthy patients to improve the national breast cancer screening program in England. Um, for that project, we had access to a big data set of mammograms from the National Breast Cancer Screening Program. That was meant to last from April 2020, which was the beginning of the pro project, to March 2023. So March, but last March. However, since the situation in 2020 was a bit complicated, we had problems accessing the data set and the access to the images was extended until July next year. This allowed us both to uh, actually work on the original part of the project, so using classical machine learning for uh, risk for assessment for breast cancer, but also gave us some further time now to work, to branch out a little bit and experiment with some less standard techniques, such as using uh, topological data analysis, TDA, for the same purposes. <clears throat> so, what I'm going to talk about today uh, will be a first part of framing the problem, which will involve absolutely no maths. I'm sorry, but yeah, when you go to applications, you actually really have to understand uh, where you are, especially since it was a project that was really meant to inform policymakers and give uh, thresholds of risks uh, for which it was convenient to use this kind of algorithms 
in practice. So not just to publish on archive saying, oh, we got an algorithm that has a 99% of accuracy and we are happy with that. Then I will expose the idea that we had um, where we could, it could be beneficial to use TDA in the kind of assessment that we are doing. And we will uh, introduce the concept of breast density as a proxy for risk. Then there will be a part where I will explain some basic tools of persistent homology. And this is a bit um, slippery slope. I, I know I was told that this conference is for a, a very broad audience. So I, saw, I thought I should assume nothing. Uh, on the other hand, I know that half of this very broad audience, maybe more, knows a lot more than me about persistent homology. So my strategy will be to go very uh, light and easy, take the very basic road and try to keep it engaging somehow. If you're very bored, um, take a nap, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but then there will be something interesting again, I hope, which will be uh, uh, the the part where I will tell you how we are going, how we are trying to use uh, persistent homology in this project. And in the end, I will tell you some further branching out that we are doing. So let's start with framing the problem. So as, as I said earlier, our project aimed at uh, using AI to enhance breast ca cancer screening in the uh, UK. Well, more specifically, we were using uh, England data. Uh, however, breast cancer screening pro program are quite similar from nation to nation uh, in most of the advanced world. So results kind of translate. It is important to think, so I think everyone heard of screening programs. Everyone has been invited to some kind of screening program, um, but we really have to think that we are not uh, talking about diagnostic tests. So we are not uh, looking at problems such as, uh, I'm going to look at an image and I'm going to find a cancer in there. We are assuming that we work with healthy people and we want to understand their risk. So that's kind of a different problem. Um, the aim of screening tests is to reduce mortality, uh, to improve uh, public health outcomes, reduce the incidence of cancers generally, uh, identifying and treating precursors of cancer, and also when it's possible to give patient choices uh, and options uh, about how to manage their own health. So for instance, if someone discovers to be a high risk, at a high risk for some cancer, maybe they want to take, do some preventive surgery or enter some experimental protocol or something. In particular, talking about uh, breast cancer sc uh, screenings, um, we aim at reducing the mortality uh, by increasing the effectiveness of the screenings, um, maximizing the benefits and minimizing the harm. A remark that I really want to do is that screening tests are not meant to be 100% accurate because Again, we are looking at risk. Even if we, we identify that someone is at high risk, that does not mean that we will have any kind of outcome with that person, luckily. Um, so again, also when we will be working with algorithms to assess risk, we will not be looking at metrics, uh, at performance metrics such as, oh, I have 99% accuracy for this. Accuracy for this. In particular, the approach that we decided to take was to replace a one-size-fits-all mammogram, mammogram fee, mammography screening, which is what happens, again, in most uh, developed countries. In particular, it's uh, generally made by um, visits every two or three years, depending on the country, where a full mammogram is taken. Uh, for women between 50 and 70 years old. Some countries start three years later, some countries end three year, uh, start three years earlier or end three years later, but that's uh, the range. 
and we would like to replace that, or suggest to replace that, with a risk-adapted screening where um, people that are at higher risk are screened more often, people that are at lower risk don't need to come in that often, and also uh, we want to adapt it in modality. For some people, uh, mammography, so x-rays, are not the best tool to be used because for some reason maybe we cannot see in that kind of imaging for them, so maybe for those people we can find a way to say to say for them it's more effective to have a, an ultrasound or something else. So the three parts of our projects were um, focused on developing algorithms, developing and evaluating, so seeing if there's something else out there that has not been tested on data similar to our own for detection, so uh, evaluating the risk of having a cancer in the image when the cancer is in the image now and visible. Then the second part was to work on masking. So how do we get risk? Uh, how, what is the risk of getting a false negative when the cancer is in the image, but it's not visible for some reason? And then the third part, the one, the one that I was working on, I am working on, and that I will be talking today, is the risk assessment part, where we look at risk of future cancer after a negative screening. After a negative screening is the part that tells us that we are working with healthy su subjects, as far as we know, are at least for what concerns uh, breast cancer. Um, a notion that we need to introduce talking about uh, breast cancer risk is the notion of breast density. This is one of the um, biggest risk factors for breast cancers. And from a point of view of a non-radiologist, non non-medical doctor, like for us, uh, it makes sense to understand it as the amount of white and, white and bright regions that we can see in a mammogram. So uh, very like visually, this breast is more black, so more fatty because fat comes across as black in X-rays. And this one is more white. So we can say that this one has more density than this other one. Uh, it's not very important for us to understand what, what kind of tissues compose these white regions fibroglandular tissues of several kinds. Also, the muscle comes out as white. Also, cancers do come out as white. But this is uh, kind of beyond our scope for us. Let's just look at pixel intensities, if you want. So I said it's uh, one of the biggest risk factors for breast cancers. But in fact, it's a two-way uh, situation. So we know that people that have denser breasts are more likely to develop a cancer, but also uh, it's more difficult to diagnose them because it's harder to detect cancer in breasts with uh, dense tissue. You can see here in the image, uh, this is a fattier breast, and you can very well see this uh, white spot here, while in this dense breast, if there was a white spot in the same point, you would not be able to see it. Um, so that that could be a, there could be a possibility of missing a cancer here. There are ways to measure breast density. Uh, in particular, what is most uh, used today is the Byrads scale and several variations on it, where uh, the percent of white pixels and also some qualities about the texture of the breast are divided in four classes. So going from, from the most uh, fatty to the most dense. The way the, that people are uh, classified in these four classes is by a uh, radiologist assessment. So every it's kind of an art. We've been uh, shadowing some radiologists that were doing assessments to see how they do it. They take some points here and there, they measure, they have the increase and lower contrast, and then they decide what percent of uh, density there is in someone's breast. And there are studies, radiologist studies, 
that show that there might be disagreements between radiologists when assessing um, breast density. Now, this is not terrible because generally uh, those studies found that, found that there's mm, agreement when, almost always agreement when we are talking about the two extreme classes. So if someone has extremely dense breast, people usually will see that. But there can be uh, some disagreement between the middle classes. So our starting question was, can we find an algorithm to accurately and objectively measure breast density in a way that is independent from uh, a human kind of understanding and evaluating with its own uh, knowledge and almost its craft, his craft. Um, and also independent, independently from the machines maker, because another problem is that the different machines, the different brands of machines that we use to take mammograms have some proprietary software usually that will process the image somehow, and the images will come out significantly different from one machine to the other. So it would be, it would be difficult to just say, I don't know, um, let's measure the intensity of pixels in a mammogram and then we have a measure because images come kind of different. So our idea was to use some, so we, we of course don't have labeled data with density, uh, or at least we can, but the labels would be some radiologist judgment. We don't have some, uh, I don't know, uh, universal uh, density score that comes down from the sky and that's, this is the right score. So we decided to use some other um, feature as a label for, 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 uh, for density, which is uh, the patient's age. Uh, what time did I start? Great. So our idea is to create um, an, algorithm, an algorithm that predicts patient's age from the digital mammograms. And then uh, we would be able to compare the predicted age with act ac the actual age of the patient. And this relies on two assumptions. One is that, uh, that assumptions that uh, we actually know to be true from medical facts, uh, which is that one is that breast density decreases with age. So, um, even if it varies a lot across the population, generally people at 35 years old will have denser, bre denser breasts than at 55. And, um, and it has a big fall around the menopause. And the other is that it's consistent over time. So for the same person, it will be like, if someone is more dense than the average at 35, they will be generally more dense than the average at 55 or 65. So working with that, um, we can imagine to have an algorithm where we give us an input normal mammograms, uh, where we know that there's no cancer in the image and the age of the patient. And then we train the algorithm to learn the correspondence between the patients, uh, between the patterns in the image and the age of the patient, uh, make some imaging based predictions. And then if the predicted age comes out lower than the actual age of the patient, then that's an image that we want to look at again, because it could be uh, denser than, it could be a sign that that person has high breast density. So the method, and here I will just throw some words and then I will unpack them uh, more slowly, is to uh, select some landmarks in the images through the uniform landmark binary patches method, and then do persistent diagrams, featureize, vectorize the information, and do some uh, traditional classification technique to divide, to classify the different age groups of the patients. So we are starting to unpack very uh, slowly, and here's the part where Probably most of you uh, don't need to listen. But I hope you will not be offended. So 
topological data analysis, a framework that applies techniques from algebraic topology to analyze uh, data sets that can be high dimensional, nonlinear, and we want to we want to use these tools to leverage some um, underlying structure in the data. Then, of course, also in deep learning, like traditional deep learning, what we do is to uh, leverage some underlying structure in the data. The point is that often in deep learning, we kind of don't know why, why we get that underlying structure, where, why does it arise, what's the theoretical foundation of that, while in TDA, we generally hope to understand what we are doing. Um, persistent homology is one of the main tools in topological data analysis. It originated at the beginning of the 2000s in, in the work of several people, kind of independently, which is very interesting. And it relies on the fact that a classical way to represent, to, to represent uh, uh, objects is to discretize them. Um, through simplicial complexes that up to now seem to be the big star of this conference. And while we know, we all know that simplicial homology provides invariance for the shape of, um, for shape description uh, of simplicial complexes, what we do with persistent homology is to describe something more. So the changes in homologies that occur during some evolution of the, of the object uh, um, with respect to some parameter that we can call the resolution, proximity parameter, or something. Or, well, being more precise, it's a framework for encoding um, the evolution of the homology of filtrations of simplicial complexes. So now the most unnecessary, no, it's not, not yet the most unnecessary slide. The process that we uh, go through when we do persistent homology is to do some data transformations. So we take some data points, um, uh, we replace them with a family of uh, simplicial complexes indexed by some parameter. And then we want to extract information, so compute the persistent homology. Then this information needs to be made available for classification prediction algorithm, so we want to transform it into some vector in some uh, smart way, if possible. So for instance, we want to transform barcode data into structured features uh, that can be used in machine learning algorithms. Um, oh, well, yeah, for, after computing persistent homology, you have to encode it as a bar barcode or something similar. I forgot the, the third part, and then you vectorize. So, um, apparently, to keep things interesting, I'm messing with the order to see if, if you can follow me. OK, so a basic model uh, for the kind of data that you usually encounter in real world problem is a finite metric space. So for instance, you have a um, collection of points that you're working with. Well, you can see them in some Rn with the Euclidean metric. Or if you're looking at vectors of uh, gene expression features, then you can uh, embed that into some big, like a R2000, for instance. And in this case, Euclidean distance will not make much sense, but you can take person correlation as a distance. So how can we discretize these uh, data sets? One way that one could think would just to take the metric topology, the natural topology on our space, and maybe that would be good enough. However, if you do that, you understand the connectivity of your data set, but you lose all the information about uh, cycles, cavities, kind of flatten out your, your data. So just uh, discretizing in the most obvious way your data set is not going uh, to be the way, generally. So what you're going to do is, is that you're going to replace your data set with an abstract simplicial complex. And again, they've come up in uh, all the talks almost today, so we are not going to stop here very long. So the question then is, 
what kind of simplicial complexes do we want? How do we construct them once you have the data? The most natural, historically important uh, construction that uh, we want to consider are check complexes. So to be uh, really precise and correct, we should go uh, through the cover space and define the nerve and all that. But for the scope of this talk, we are just going to take a combinatorial basic approach and just give the recipe on of how you construct it on your data. So let X be your finite sus subspace of RD, and this is kind of a big assumption. You, you want to uh, be able to embed your points in a Euclidean space. You fix some epsilon bigger than zero, and then the check complex space uh, is the abstract simplicial complex where you take the points as vertices and you put a k simplex when this intersection here is non empty. So, give a picture, but um, a way of fattening points and see where you want to put uh, your skeleton. Is this a good construction? Does this really describe your underlying topological space? This is something that needs to be, to be proved um, for what is called the nerve lemma for the reference. Uh, you have guarantees that when you take the top, the check complex, you have something that has the same homotopy uh, type than uh, that of your uh, starting space. So we are safe when we are working with check complexes. There is a computational pitfall, however. You saw that we have these intersections that we have to compute, and this is computationally very heavily very heavy uh, in practice is unfeasible when you're working. And also um, for the number of vertices that you're taking, um, the way that you're adding k simplices, you risk of having very high dimensional uh, uh, spaces that you're building. So really not ideal from the computational point of view. Moreover, we've started from this assumption, assumption that we are embedding the points in a Euclidean space. And maybe this is something that we cannot do. So it's kind of a very strict context. We can do something a bit uh, more agile by taking uh, Vittori com uh, complexes. Again, we take a finite metric space, uh, parameter epsilon bigger than zero. And a uh, Vittori super complex is the abstract simplicial complex where we take, again, the points of x as vertices, and we have to just check uh, this distance of pairwise distance of points. So we have less calculations to do to know where we want to put that simplex. We have less uh, theoretical guarantees with the uh, uh, Vittori Rips complexes because we don't have something like the nerve lemma that tells us that we are working with something that is really describing our starting space. However, we can use check complexes to uh, see that Vittori's complexes approximate them well enough. So again, we can consider that we have uh, fair um, theoretical guarantees and work with Rips complexes. So it's very important that these constructions are functorial. Uh, so we will be safe also when we pass to homology. So this is just a little example to see that uh, the way that we compute intersection or distances to know where we put edges and faces and cells of several dimensions, um, how they give different complexes in, in, in uh, complexes in the end. Uh, so you see here you have the check complex and here you have the rips complex. So um, generally they, they, they can be different, uh, different recipe, diff slightly different outcome, although very closely related. These are not the only constructions. In fact, 
in the literature, new constructions keep coming uh, up. And also, these are not the also because these are not the most convenient to use from a computational point of view. I'm not going to describe all the others because, again, it's a bit beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, but it's just to give references. Um, oh, where is it? Here. So you have the the Lonely triangulations where you try to reduce the dimensionality of your complexes, alpha complexes, and that where you also um, reduce the number of higher dimensional parts. Cubical complexes are a construction that is um, best suited for images because for like things composed by pixels where you can compare pixel intensities and witness complexes uh, again don't reduce the number of vertices because they don't use all the points but have a landmark selection selection stage so you end up with something a bit smaller and more agile so this is all we want to know about this um and we are ready to give the definition of persistent homology that again everyone knew <laughs> before I went through all this. Uh, a K is a filtered simply shell complex if it's a finite uh, simply shell complex with a uh, sequence of nested subcomplexes. Sub so, this is a picture from this paper with nice colors. Um, the persistent homology of a uh, filtered simply shell complex is, as you guessed or as you knew, the uh, pair given by the pth homology of a certain simplex in here and uh, the maps given by the inclusion of your filtration. Okay, so as for usual homology, they will tell you what's, uh, how, what you can say about the shape of your data when two data sets are very different, but most importantly, how the uh, data kind of evolves. How do you encode information from persistent homology? The, the information that you want to encode, what you want to uh, remember are persistent pairs. So when cycles in the different uh, levels of homology, um, when, components of the different level of homology are born and when they die. So for instance, a persistent pair given a certain filtration, it's a pair PQ where P is smaller than Q, that represent uh, when a homology class is born uh, at step P and that it dies at step Q. Here you have this um, cycle here that is born at uh, two and is filled here by a phase so it dies at step three and this would be a two three persistent pair <clears throat> how do we encode them to be able to use them there are several techniques so <laughs> barcodes are the most common Then you have oh, persistent diagrams, persistent landscapes, and several other techniques. Um, these are there are more recent things that are come up. The literature is kind of very active in this field, so these are maybe just points that give you the historical uh, path that this discipline made. Then there's much more to explore. Um, we'll just say what's a barcode, or at least make a picture to, to say what's a barcode. It's a way to encode Betty numbers. Um, so you have, for all the levels of homology, you put a point at a certain uh, parameter for all the um, classes. So here we have all the points uh, in dimension zero. You have no cycles, so there's nothing here. Uh, no cavity, so nothing here. Then you have some cycles that are, that you can see here, and so on. And you can see that it kind of looks like a barcode. And they represent the lifespan of homology classes through the length of the intervals. 
uh, another way to represent persistent pairs is through persistent diagrams. And this is just, you encode the birth on one axis, the death on the other. Uh, something that can be said here is that uh, when you have lots of points around this uh, diagonal, they can be considered as noise because it means that some classes are just like born and dead very uh, quickly. There are some settings where you don't want to consider them as noise. Um, so here is just to illustrate this example. And again, they represent this the exact same thing as before in a different way. So something that we want, the last thing of this natural of persistent homology is that it, just to be sure that we are working with something theoretically sound is um, how do, you know, do we know that perturbations in data don't affect barcodes or any kind of encodings that we took for persistent homology too much. So is, is it a stable theory? Well, we can define some uh, distances on barcodes, for instance, so such as the bottleneck distance, the Wasserstein distance. Um, I will not go further in that. And just I want to reassure you that we have stability theorems. So yes, undermine the assumptions. If the input doesn't change much, then the barcode will not change much. So, okay, we agreed that we have, we can visualize through barcodes persistent homology. And then um, how do we actually use it in machine learning? Because we cannot give like a barcode to a super vector machine or a neural network. One way, well, then for instance, we can use them just as they are for visualization, but then we can bin our barcodes one technique and um, do all the um, descriptive statistics for the barcode uh, with respect to that binning. So mean standard deviation, interquartile range, uh, median of the birth, of the cycles, of the, of the classes, of the death, um, of the lifespan of the bars in your uh, barcode. Uh, this is not the only method. There are, again, this is even, there are more and more things coming out all the time for methods to take persistent homology uh, information and use it in machine learning pipelines. Uh, a way to classify them is as statistical vectorization, such as the one that I just illustrated, uh, algebraic vectorization, which are those where you take the barcode and associate somehow a polynomial to them, uh, curve vectorizations uh, that um, you can get defining maps from R to some vector space, such as landscapes, for instance. Functorial vectorizations are just a more general case of curve vectorizations, but since there are so many curve vectorizations, it makes sense to consider a taxonomy where we uh, look at them as different uh, beasts. And ensemble vectorizations, which are vectorizations where we need lots of uh, barcodes and we have several steps of uh, processing to generate some features. So if you want a roundup on all these methods, there is this uh, survey, a uh, survey of vectorization methods in topological data analysis. It's a really, really short paper, like, um, yeah, 12 pages, but 12 pages include all the benchmarking on open data sets. So if you want just the taxonomy of the method, it's very uh, brief. It's very like a, more uh, for a manual for working that doesn't, that does not delve very much in theory. Uh, it's published on a IEEE, so it's, it's meant to be uh, working material more than exploring the theoretical roots. But it's super recent, so it has all the references for what's coming out for what's come out um, very recently. And with this, we have finished the theoretical part, and we can go back to our work with mammograms. So this is um, a joint work with uh, in progress with uh, Dashti Ali. Arasazad and Adam Brennan. That starts with okay, 
we have the problem with that we were talking about before. We want to read breast density um, and actually the age of the patients from mammograms. We want to use persistent homology. Um, mammogram for one patient looks like this. So we have four images per patient. Per, so it's kind of a lot of pixels if we take the whole image. The method that we are going to use is through this uh, selection of landmarks. So don't be scared by this. I'm going to just saying every little bit uh, in a second. Um, because we don't want to use all the pixels in, in our image. As I said, it would be huge. Even if we resize too much the image, well, then, then we lose information. We don't want to do that. We want to select points that are somehow significant for the texture of uh, the, the X-ray. To, to do that, what we do is to use some sort of filters that we use to span our uh, image, um, where we look at the pixel intensity. These numbers seen here are the pixel intensities of the pixels. And we apply this function here to select uh, landmarks. Um, it just means look at the center. Um, if this is bigger than the center, then put a one here. If it's smaller, put a zero. So we go from squares that look like this to square that have just a hole in the middle and some ones and zero uh, all around uh, that we can encode with these uh, rounds where, well, the light blue circle is the, the center. And we put some black circles for the ones and some white circles for the zeros. What we do is that we pass the filter on our image. If the result here is something like where we pass from zero to one and from one to zero more than once, then we discard that central pixel. Um, if what we see is something like this, where you have all the ones all together and all the zeros all together, then we might consider that one as that pixel in the center as one of our landmarks. When do we actually consider it? We have the list of what we call geometries, which are all the ways, all the configurations. Just look at the first uh, column here of one point, one black point, and all the others white, two, and then all the others white, three, and all the others white. So these are our geometries. And we might decide that for our problem, the geometry that, that the landmarks that will be more significant for our problem will be geometry four. So when we have four ones and four zeros. So if we decide that the geometry four is important for us, the landmarks that we are going to select in the images are going to be the uh, pixels that lie here in the middle that have around this kind of uh, configurations of one of zeros. And then not only this one, but because we also have all the rotations. So when we compute those landmarks, we have to compute uh, like persistent homology for all the possible um, rotations. Um, so different system of landmarks for the same image. So an example, we take a little filter here. We suppose that it's, uh, of course, it's uh, here. There's more than nine pixels, but uh, suppose that I, I draw a, a small enough square that you only have nine pixels in there. You get some numbers, some pixel intensities. You threshold them, you get this, and then you draw all the landmarks that correspond to this kind, that to correspond to the center of all these kind of configurations. And how do we choose which geometry do you want? Do we want to use? At the current stage, we look at this and we say, yeah, yeah, this here kind of, you can see that there's uh, less points when here it's whiter, here there's a kind of darker area and here you see a bigger concentration. So maybe, maybe like very heuristically, this geometry is the one that is telling us something about the texture of breast density here. 
and then um, you go on and compute your persistent homology with those points. The way we set up our experiment was to select um, some normal studies from the data set that I was talking at the very beginning, the one with images from the National Breast Cancer Screening Program. <clears throat> so a little window on this data set because it's very rare to have access to this kind of images. If you want to work with mammograms, you can find some open data sets online and they are generally very bad quality, have annotations on them. Most of them are scans from film because they are very, very old and no hospital actually still uses film for mammograms. Uh, what we have here is uh, data from 18,800 18, patients from three different trusts in England. And um, they have all uh, experts determine ground truth on them. So we know which are malignant, which are benign, which whatever, all, lots of information of them. We have the coordinates for the malignant cases. So where the cancer is, but again, this project, we are not going to use the malignant ones. We have for other things. And they are linked to clinical data, not uh, very informative clinical data because usually at the, um, at the screening program, you don't uh, collect things like people's BMA, that's BMI, that is another risk factor. So that you don't actually know, but you have the age of the patient, you have like the brand of the machine that has been taken, you have the compression force that, that's been applied to take the image that can give you other information as a proxy. So the data that we had was like, we had the 5,500 malignant cases, 600 benign, 800 malignant without the annotations, still useful. Um, and a lot of, a lot. For what it's possible to usually have, we also had lots of interval cancer, which are cancers that, that are diagnosed between two uh, screening visits. And also 10,000 normal, which is what we used for this. Uh, project. So we selected normal study, people that we knew that we also had. A good thing with this is that we had historical data. So for the same patient, we sometimes we, we, we even had four different visits. So we took people that had a normal mammograms at some, at some time, but we also knew that they had a normal mammogram three years later. So we are fairly sure that in the one that we are looking at, there's nothing to be seen. And we divided in three um, categories under 55 years of age, 55 to 65, and over 50 to 65. This is, of course, just to get a proof of principle because then we would want to get continuous uh, predictions. Then we preprocess the images in a very minimal way for the moment because we don't want to influence um, the results that we get with some very heavy preprocessing. Processing. So, in, for instance, we just removed the 4% top and bottom from the image because we are interested, again, in density, in something that we see just in the middle. So we are not interested in the top part where you see a lot of pectoral muscle. Um, and the bottom part is generally either all black or sometimes you can see the ribs or the belly of the patient. Again, something that we don't want to take into account. And then we selected landmarks with uh, the method that I showed you before with a uh, with little filter and uh, thresholding. Uh, computed vitro research and glacial complexes with standard lab libraries. Um, to be fair, to do that, there's also a little widget that I has made for that's based, based on MATLAB code that you can use to get that kind of uh, landmarks if you want to have a low code or no code approach. Uh, ask me for the GitHub later if you're interested in that, but otherwise we just used um, standard libraries in Python. Um, applied landmarks, per produced bar persistent barcodes, vectorized them using the statistics, the descriptive statistics method, uh, concatenated the features of all the rotation of the same geometry. So at first we focused on geometry four because it looked to us that it was kind of descriptive. Um, and we took all the rotation of that because we had no uh, way to say that one rotation was more informative to the other in theory. For this kind of problem, it should not be the case. 
So we get very, very big vectors. Again, four images, lots of pixels, lots of landmarks, lots of rotations, and concatenate everything and put everything into a super vector machine. We could have used more um, sophisticated methods to classify them, <laughs> but we thought if it works, we want to see it work with some very basic classification uh, to understand if maybe there's something before the classification that we can improve. So here you have the whole pipeline that I've been describing in a summary. Where <clears throat> here is the like the red dots the, of the landmarks in the different geometries. If you take different geometries, we didn't. But as you can see, there are several degrees of freedom in this process that I illustrated you. Lots of choices that we made that are kind of arbitrary, and we don't know if it was reasonable to make or if there are more reasonable choices. So um, on a side that is not relative to topological analysis is the preprocessing, but that's kind of important. Can we do a different in preprocessing? Something that we thought of trying next once we extinguish all we can do with the full images is to take just the area behind the nipple in a mammogram because actually if we have a square here it gives all the information that we need it's not it's not getting confused by other things that you can have around uh, oh also in the preprocessing we eroded the, the, the um how do you say the edge of the breast because you can only see the rind of the skin and the skin is not informative of breast Density. Also, the nipple, we removed that because, again, not informative. We would like to just try some patches from the center of the breast. This implies writing some code that can extract a patch where every mammogram has a different size. Everyone has the, muscle, the, the, the pectoral muscle in different positions, so it's kind of tricky. We're kind of, underst kind of understanding how to do that. Then... We used uh, Vittori Sirip complexes. We also tried cubical complexes because it's um, the standard way to go around it. Um, but how do we know? Is there some rationale to choose the right complexes to use for some problem? We don't know. Lots of degrees of free freedom. Then again, which of the geometries of the landmark do we have to choose? We went to four because we could see in the image something that maybe we're not seeing right, maybe we're missing something, maybe, I don't know. And then the vectorization technique, does it change something? One possible way to solve all this question would be to do all the permutations, start systematically to do all the experiments. Um, for the moment, it is what we are doing to have a feel of the problem, but it doesn't seem the right way to go around it. So here's where we started thinking about interpretability of persistent homology. This is something that in uh, traditional machine learning, now it's a very big topic. Uh, explainable AI is something that we really need if we want to use in practice um, AI. Like if you want to use algorithms for insurance purposes or, or in healthcare, you cannot use black boxes. You need to know why certain choices are being made and why certain things work or don't work. So this is another um, pro work that uh, we've started with Adam Brendel, Nina Otis, and uh, Renata Turkes, which aims at understanding what type of topological and geometric features uh, are captured in uh, persistent intervals. Uh, so we need to understand why and when persistent homology uh, works. And if we do all the questions that I was asking earlier, which kind of complexes should we use? What kind of geometry? Why does it, why this geometry is saying something should be kind of uh, guided by some um, underlying reason. So this uh, project, um, we've decided to take, tackle it in two parts. And the first part would be to derive the importance of these different 
<coughs> regions in the data, and then to analyze uh, which applications that are published that have success and compare if it agrees with what we've understand. Now, talking about applications of uh, persistent homology is a bit delicate because in the literature we have kind of a lot of uh, proof of concepts, but not a lot of uh, tested, externally evaluated applications. However, there is enough to see if what we uh, understand here, like theoretically, agrees with what works in practice. So uh, what we are doing now, since we have images and we are working on that, the first thing that we are looking is understanding the importance of pixels in an image and trying to do something like uh, saliency maps for traditional machine learning. Um, and then from there, pass to uh, points in a point cloud where we have less structure and it could be more difficult to have some sort of understanding. So here is where we are now. We are trying to, instead of uh, put up on pause, the trying to do different experiments just to see what goes on. And we are trying to understand why things work when they work. And I will stop here a bit earlier. Are there any questions? Thanks for your talk. That was very interesting. I definitely did not fall asleep. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned that you use these geometries. And uh, if I understand correctly, you fix one geometry for, for an image, right? And, and was there a particular reason why you chose to fix that? Why not uh, choose different ones? Because it seems like choosing a particular one, you are um, overemphasizing particular regions and underemphasizing others. And there is you know, some sort of natural geometry to the shape. Um, yeah, so we did end up choosing one geometry rather than um, encatenating all the feature vectors from all the geometries for uh, uh, for computational reasons. <laughs> because to uh, concatenate all the geometries and make it feasible, then we would have to resize the images too much. And we had like, we managed to do it with images that had the uh, 370 something times 200 pixels. So small that, I don't know, it seems unlikely that an algorithm can read a fine texture of breast densities in that. So for that reason, we did, we decided, okay, we're not using all the geometries, we're fixing one. Our guess, or at least um, the guess that the, I had that, that I was trying to push in the group was to use uh, smaller geometries where you have like um, one more intense, or two more intense pixels on the others to zero, because I thought um, density is kind of a matter of matter of texture. You want to see where it's uh, the image is kind of darker. There is like the the ducts here are finer, and you have small cavities, uh, um, and in contrast to where it's all white and full. So my guess for no particular reason after as an afterthought was that smaller geometries would encode finer uh, pattern textures. While I thought bigger geometries would kind of find edges of big um, um, masses inside the image. However, then we ended up doing, using geometry four because we tested several settings and they ended up giving us better accuracy. <laughs> so uh, it, it disproved my intuition that uh, smaller geometries were giving us finer textures. It disproved other people's intuition that we should use the bigger ones. And it was like, four is the best because maybe we should look at interpretability. <laughs> 
So that's that's uh, the the full honest story of how that uh, ended up coming up. Great, thanks. Uh, so actually, I also wanted to ask something about these geometries. Um, I noticed that in this picture, uh, you always have uh, consecutive black and white points. Is there a reason for that? Um, yeah, the reason is uh, that, 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 that that's the method that we... Hey, you have to decide some way to uh, pick your landmarks. Otherwise, you end up, you end up using all the, all the pixels. And one way is this we choose the pixel that around them has this kind of formation of zeros and ones mm -hmm. um and that was it it's a technique that's been uh, used in a proof of principle by these people in a classification using mammograph scans scans or a, of a open data set so um, yeah just a proof of principle but, um, Another arbitrary choice, if you want, we have to select some pixels, and this is a way to do it. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? That will be difficult. Okay, thank you for for your talk. Uh, what I was uh, asking myself uh, is that in many in many uh, applications, if uh, if one if one wants to uh, apply some topological uh, uh, features, uh, it's uh, mm, often it's difficult to understand whether in the data there is some topo topological information or not, and uh, uh, I think this is very related to. Uh, your problem you mentioned in the end of interpretability of uh, of persistent homology and uh, what i was asking is uh, if uh, you have uh, tried to do the same kind of classification with the other methods uh, without a topology and what is the difference if uh, i don't know convolutional neural networks or something like that so yes um it's difficult to compare though um, so as I said before, the first um, two and a half year of this project, we were purely working with classical machine learning techniques because that was like, like the pro the project we proposed was that. So uh, we ended up evaluating uh, an algorithm that um, used a combination of transformer and neural networks. Um, neural network, nothing. Particularly, we, we tried several things and something like RSNet, so an off the shelf uh, neural network, not super sophisticated, pre trained on, on ImageNet, like what you would try, works pretty well in the task of uh, reading um, risk. But uh, we cannot compare because we don't know if what that uh, tweaked ResNet is uh, reading is density or something else. Like um, the model, we did publish uh, on that, the results of that evaluation. We were quite satisfied with that, but we don't know what it's looking at. Um, it's as successful as radiologists in stratifying patients uh, per, for risk. So we can, we did kind of say that we advise under th certain thresholds to use it as an aid to radiologists. Of course, it cannot replace one because we don't know what's looking at. You can um, use saliency maps to do this kind of post-doc explainability, which is not, uh, well, still something that you explain a posterior is not great. Um, and it seemed that uh, that ResNet was looking at microclassification or other formation that could become cancerous at some point. Um, so maybe it was doing a better uh, computer-aided detection than human eyes. We, we, we don't know. So we, we can compare with that. And our aim here is like, we are not going to be satisfied with this work until we reach um, the same scores that we reach with that ResNet. Uh, on the other hand, we don't know if they are doing the same job 
because we don't know what's the job that the ResNet is doing. Okay, if there are any more questions. Uh, well, if not, uh, let's thank Celeste again. <laughs>